it's good to see you back here uh, this afternoon. You see I've lost my sweater. Uh, it was heating up here, so I thought I would take it off and uh, you know, get ready for our further discussion. Um, since we still have a number of questions on the table for our panelists, uh, we've asked them to remain up here. Uh, though this is intended not just to be a dialogue with them, but a dialogue, dialogue among ourselves. So uh, uh, we are starting a little bit late, so I would echo what Nermeen and Raj said earlier about trying to keep our interventions and responses short. And I will try to do my part to try to keep my uh, brief presentation short as well. Um, so uh, we do have questions on the table from the previous section, uh, but before going to those, I wanted to do what I promised in the initial session and provide a little bit more detail about the survey we conducted recently in the task force. And if I could have the slides on work stream one. This is gonna be an update on our work uh, to date in the task force. So here you see uh, some details. I'll go very quickly through this, who we reached out to, who responded from different regions. Uh, we were very pleased that the responses were up from the similar survey that was done in 2019, about 24%, I believe it was. Um, but of concern uh, remains the fact, as I think we talked about in the earlier session, that we still have our work cut out for us in reaching all of the wider sector. And you see, uh, kudos to water, all 16 CC members responded to the survey, uh, but we only had 13 wider sector players from outside the CC uh, circle. So if I could have the next slide. Um, now I gave you a brief uh, foreshadowing of our conclusion, and those of you who have read our report have already seen it. Uh, that there is a consensus, I think, among uh, stakeholder groups in the UPU that uh, wider postal sector players should uh, play a role in decision making. Um, perhaps echoing what Keith said in the second panel, uh, it, it doesn't appear that wider sector players are seeking a formal governance role, but they're seeking the opportunity to provide input into the process. And you see here the responses we got from the five stakeholder groups wider sector players, whether in the CC or outside, were unanimous in saying they should play a role in decision-making. Uh, ministries and uh, regulators were very favorable. And I think we heard that from Zaidi and uh, Mr. Guzman this morning. Uh, DOs had a more, more of a mixed view. And I think John Paul in his presentation this morning highlighted some concerns perhaps that, sorry, John Paul, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, I think you did highlight some concerns that designated operators have and that have to be addressed just as uh, in the subsequent panel, I think our wider uh, postal sector participants are prepared to address some other questions too. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, now, we did have a question this morning and an observation that there was um, support for a business council. And I wanted to explain in detail why Samir and I concluded, and I should note parenthetically, as I should have at the outset, that unfortunately Samir is not able to be with us this afternoon. So I'll be flying solo, but with uh, the panelists' assistance. Um, and you'll see here, Particularly among CC members, there's strong support uh, for a business council. Uh, there's strong support among regulators and some support among governments. Very little support among designated operators. Uh, but in the UPU, uh, in other contexts, we're always fond of looking for the mean or the midpoint. And so when we looked at this chart and we went down at the 50% line, we thought, uh, we're coming out in an enhanced CC. Um, certainly that's true, uh, governments and um, regulators, uh, even designated operators, it's right close to the border. And I think what's important from this chart is that 
If there's one other takeaway we can have, it's the extent of dissatisfaction among existing CC members with the consultative committee. Um, in its previous form, and Walter has highlighted the reforms that have occurred, the thematic chapters are new. They were not in place in the last cycle. So that's an important change uh, that we will see the results of. But there are other changes perhaps we want to consider because it, when you look at that uh, result, you probably don't want to stand still in terms of, of the changes. Um, but again, do note that there is a large uh, part of our community that does already see a business council as a possibility. Um, and so I want to make sure that's uh, seen as well. So the next slide. Um, and then in our survey, we asked what CC members want and bring. And we heard from several wider sector players uh, today. Uh, what they expect is improved interconnectivity to the benefit of both parties. Um, seamless and improved experience for customers, access to knowledge and experience. That's the UPU as the forum and the knowledge center and the standard setting body. Um, some see an ability to show the, shape the global postal alliance, potentially increase postal volumes. I think Keith spoke about that in his, and Kate in their presentations. Um, and then some other issues there as well. And, um, and then we also asked what wider sector players would bring uh, to the table. Uh, access to new technology is knowledge and expertise, uh, new postal services to citizens, new interconnections. Again, the interconnectivity uh, possibilities were there as well. But I do want to make one uh, point and happy to engage offline with you about the detailed results of the survey. It was interesting when we looked at them that there was a difference between how associations and individual companies responded and you have to parse that. And I think we have to remember that uh, in the new CC, we have a whole range of stakeholders that have taken part. We have private delivery companies, we have courier companies who have some interest, we have other companies as well that will bring other things to the table. And that's why the thematic chapters are so important to enable them to specialize and focus in particular areas. Um, next slide. Uh, I think we did this one. And then I, this is where we come out. These were the five um, uh, five options that we identified. And as I said, we've concluded that the way to go at this stage, understanding that we're talking, as John Paul said, after Abishan, where we agreed to do certain things, we're looking at what we can do at the Extraordinary Congress. And then in the future, we'll be teeing up um, uh, reform and change as a permanent process, as a continuum. But for right now, we think an enhanced CC is the way to go. And then the devil is in the details, as it will be regarding products and services. And uh, I think we probably owe you a mea culpa, and this actually addresses a question that China posed, where would the CC report? And you see in this chart, uh, and this was put there because it was the only way to make it fit on the page, but it's put as being equivalent to the POC and the CA. I mean, that's one option. But I think a lot of discussion has to go into that, and that's perhaps not the preferred option that people have. Right now, the uh, consultative committee reports to the CA. Um, but as John Paul said in his presentation, you know, the POC is really the technical body with the operational expertise about how the network works. And, and so perhaps there is an argument for the uh, reporting or the most direct relationship to be with the POC. But that is something we want to hear from all of you about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I think Walter alluded to this as well. Um, the consultative committee worked hard in the last cycle on a transformation proposal. Uh, that was present, presented um, to the council 
Given the separate work that was going in, on in the opening task force in that cycle, chaired by Kenya and Belgium, it was incorporated and certain elements were included, but not all elements. Um, so here you see uh, the proposals in the inst uh, Istanbul cycle, the institutional position of the CC, the status quo, no decision-making role. Um, some, then there was acceptance of an enhanced advisory role, uh, influencing and consulting, but the line was drawn at the idea of directly reporting or directly submitting a proposal to Congress. And the next slide. And some other elements of that transformation proposal. And I think uh, this comes to a point John Paul made also about, um, and Samir in his closing comments talked about how the main door of the UPU is open, but some side doors are closed. And John Paul uh, highlighted some concerns that would exist with requests for access to those side doors. And those have to be uh, explored as part of the definition of what an enhanced consultative committee would be. So right now, the status quo, participation is limited in exceptional cases, uh, duly approved by the chairs of the CA and POC. We have wider postal sector players here who can testify to their experience. I'm guessing they may say that they have been excluded in more than extraordinary circumstances, but I'm not going to prejudge that. They can, they can speak for themselves. Um, and then, but more importantly, the things that were on the table and that were not accepted in Abidjan and that we might want to consider if we want to take a second look at and uh, include as uh, part of an, enhan an enhanced CC is um, requiring referral to the consultative committee of any de proposed decision in the POC so it can provide input um, before that decision is taken. Having a designated liaison between the councils and the consultative committee. Um, again, coming back to Jean-Paul's presentation, extended participation to all standing groups. Uh, there were clearly some concerns there, and I'd welcome views from other designated operators and um, also wider sector players about that aspect of the debate, because there was also a comment about the fact that in the past, wider sector players were quite quiet in council sessions. Um, so we have to understand why that was, and perhaps one reason was they felt that the decisions had gone further. Uh, they could have influenced the decisions better at an earlier stage when they were in, the, in development in the groups. But again, we have to talk about that. And finally, again, the direct proposal to Congress. So the next slide. So we're going to have an open discussion now, and we'll go next to the next slide and uh, just tee up some questions which have already been asked by some of you, uh, including India and um, uh, China and, um, and others. So um, I thought we had another slide, but perhaps not. Well, in any case, let's go then to the questions. And I think Walter and Jean-Paul, why don't we turn first uh, to the question I think we received uh, from China about, Walter, you spoke, oh, here we are, okay. So uh, again, this is the question China asked, who should the enhanced CC be reporting to? How should it engage in the decision-making process? Um, let's say financing for the end. I think we want to talk about decision-making first. Um, but let's, let's start with these, uh, these questions and get input first from Walter and John Paul and Zaidi about, and I'm not sure, do we have Mr. Guzman online? Or if he is online, he's more, uh, more than welcome to chime in as well. But um, Walter, uh, you spoke about the fact that you've doubled the size of the consultative committee. It's a big success of our Abidjan decisions. 
but obviously uh, you spoke also about a value proposition that the new members will, I'm sure, evaluate each year. So um, what do you think are the factors they will be looking at as they make that decision, I guess you said in January, but then each successive year? And how do we make uh, this outreach and this inclusion sustainable over the longer term? Yeah, that's, that's a key, key question. Um, the, reason, the reason why those, those wider postal sector players are currently joining is um, access to the UPU, better understanding what's possible, even access uh, because they are providers um, in the supply chain management area. They understood that uh, they can offer things to the UPU um, that are currently in demand. They also understood that they need to better understand what are the standards, what are the prerequisites to be actually allowed to provide those services. Um, so we are currently moving actually through an ed educational process. Okay. Now that's really what's happening. Um, and, also, and also to, to um, enable um, interconnectivity possibly between certain designated operators interested um, in the services wider postal sector players can actually offer. A little bit like, like Keith said, uh, downstream, upstream access policies, uh, connectivity when it comes to labeling, connectivity when it comes to these pressing digital um, topics. Um, it is also very interesting currently to see that uh, when we see that the, the first round of, um, of interest is now being being <clears throat> enhanced into a second round of interest. So we have those, I, I would call the copycats. Uh, but they are coming because their competitors are already in. <laughs> um, uh, and then there, uh, there is th those um, who uh, took some time to further see and evaluate what's actually happening. Um, and those are those who might be perceived as market dominant players in a certain pillar of the market. Yeah. Okay. So these are uh, large associations um, representing a major part of uh, a certain market. These are large electronic interfaces. Um, so this is Very marketplaces, phrased, yeah, yes. marketplaces, mm -hmm. those guys. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is also putting pressure um, on us uh, here within the UPU yeah, because we need to deal with them. And that's the reason why I'm so happy that we established already with the chair of the POC um, a clear working, working level where I'm allowed to report to the POC um, as a privilege, of course. Um, <clears throat> and um, I already reached out to certain designated operators who have experience with those, with those electronic interfaces. Okay. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when talking to them um, and asking them uh, for, their, for their expectations, um, it is quite clear that they start to understand that the UPU is a provider of interconnectivity or facilitator of uh, networks, access to networks and access to products and services um, under their own um, regime under their own standards, um, under their own um, kind of certification environment. And this seems to be a, a very important topic. Mm -hmm. So if you take a very large electronic interface, it is highly important for them to understand what are the prerequisites to actually be allowed to act within the wider sector players or the designated operators. And there seems to be a lot of benefit, and that's the reason why they are prepared to share their views and, and even their market data with the UPU. Yeah? And if I could ask one follow-up question, I was struck in your presentation, you talked about the fact that the rapporteurs were not market dominant players. What would you see as the risk if one of them sought that role? Well, the risk would be um, if one of those new positions um, either gets vacant Mm -hmm. um, or a new chapter is established uh, and we can't find anybody else but one of those market dominant players. Um, so um, the structure currently is um, if there are more than one 
uh, applicant, yeah, then there are elections. Uh, so. yeah, and uh, of course, uh, that would be immediately a topic uh, of the management committee. So I'm not the one to decide that. That's the topic of the management committee, and they are also elected. Yeah, um, and um, these, these elections will happen, yes, but um, it is, it is uh, for the committee to, to elect. Um, um, and I'm very happy that uh, um, we were strong enough with our new members um, to put those rapporteurs in place. And you're absolutely right. None of them is a market dominant player mm -hmm. in the market. And um, we, we discussed that with one or two of those market dominant players during the post expo um, in Frankfurt. And um, they said, yeah, that's fine. That's a very in interesting structure for us. Um, we will participate. And then it's up to the rapporteur and finally also to the vice chair and chair of, of, of the consultative committee. And if something happens there to the management committee to deal with these topics. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing here again is a well balanced um, chapter. Also, also, of course, balanced in the way that we need participation also coming from all regions in the world. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and also to make sure that uh, those new members do understand, and that, that's the kind of educational process we are trying to implement right now, what are the rules? Mm -hmm. yeah? So they need to understand the rules are decided by the UPU, by the member states, yeah? and whoever wants to play needs to play according to these rules. Okay. Um, and, and when it comes to technology providers, and, uh, and we have seen that now with two or three, um, world-class leaders in, in certain, certain, certain technologies, um, they understood that their services might be put onto the IT backbone of the UPU to the benefit of the designated operators. But it doesn't happen as such. They have to go through a certification process. Yeah? And, and after a year or so, that has to be decided, of course, by the member states and in close co collaboration with the POC, of course. Um, they also have to be audited. Yeah, okay, but well, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. That's and, uh, and that is a cost they will have to take. Okay, well, let's come back to that in a minute. If we could go to the next slide, I'm going to ask John Paul and Zaidi for their thoughts as well. Um, but I want to tie the question. Do you want to ask you? Que je well, I, I, I wanted to tie the question. I think we've answered India's question about market dominant players, okay. but we also had a separate question from Alessandra about some aspects of the uh, consultative committee, whether there was a risk that it would work uh, in opposition to the Postal Operations Council. So I think I wanted to add that question into the mix as you respond, because I think it's relevant to this working relationship and then also to the question about where the CC reports. And so, um, and not to take too long, and I do want to get to other questions from the floor, but Alessandra also asked a question about the USO and the differing obligations of DOs versus private operators. And, you know, we're cross-fertilizing each other. We heard a question in the last panel about balancing rights and obligations. So I'm throwing a lot in there, but I wanted to add those elements to you as you think. Ça fait beaucoup de choses. Oui. Well, that's a lot. But fine. Um, obviously, these are questions that need to be asked. Uh, obviously, the order we put them in is uh, tricky, but there's no problem. First of all, on the question of who the CC has to report to. I would, would say, if you think about it, those who think that we should create a business council, and I'm not really sure about uh, how I would say that in French, business council, but it's not important, um, the business council would need to be close to the CA, so the CC would have to report to the POC. That's the logic there. Um, but I don't think that's the major issue. Um, what it makes me think, well, two things really. Often people say that the POC has taken uh, the reins 
in this union. They do what they want. They govern the union. They have the power. But I would remind you that all of the most important decisions of the POC are submitted for approval to the Council of Administration. Product range and remuneration, um, all of those, and you'll have seen it this week, um, go through that process. The committees are doing that as well. We'll finish this off tomorrow. So a lot comes to the CA. Um, the most structural decisions, if you like, with the POC have always been further endorsed by the CA. And I think that's healthy. Um, there's no criticism here. So I think that's worth remembering when people say that the POC does what it wants. Now, talking about working groups and task force, I don't know exactly what the number of groups is in the POC, maybe 30 or so, between 20 and 30. Apologies for my ignorance of the exact figure. Do you know how many are closed? Two. So, and, and, and many of them are significantly open. The addressing group, for example, is open. Um, everything that relates to, to financial services has been open for, for a long time. Um, it works well. I think it's even necessary. It is the members themselves who want this opening. It's a word we've been using today. Um, transport and customs are closed for reason which, reasons which I touched upon this morning. So maybe one day um, that will be reopened, but the texts we have today provide that it is the chairs who consult their members in the groups and that they um, propose possible closure. So it's the exception rather than the rule. And it is the um, chair of the POC who rubber stamps that decision. So I don't want to dodge the question, but I, I do think that the question of where the CC reports to is not the major issue. What is important is a rich dialogue with the CC. And once again, without any um, obligation involved, I think spontaneously these dialogues have begun. There were three meetings since Abidjan and three times Walter came to us and explained uh, where things stood. And as I said this morning, um, what you need to do is um, continue that same process with the working groups. And I think as we move towards S3, um, we can look forward to this dialogue. I don't know if that responds to all of the questions that you asked. Regulatory standpoint? Not much. <laughs> I think uh, we have experts from chair of CC, chair of POC. They have years of experience in terms of invo uh, involvement of wider stakeholders. I think that is something that we can uh, consider. Uh, but it has to be fit for purpose. I think we all has to agree. How is the reporting wise? I think it's up to the members to decide. I mean, if we have the option, but it has to be fit for purpose and it has to be a clear uh, ruling on what is the scope of, of enhanced CC or whatever. And in UPU, we all know we have always have check and balance. No committee is really can decide by its own. But the, in terms of the risk, we, I think it's, it is it being taken care of, I think. You know, shouldn't be thinking about a committee to overrule other committees. I think we all have a check and balance. Right. No, that's a great, uh, great point as well. Um, 
So you've heard our panelists here. We have the question up on the screen about uh, where the consultative committee should report, though as Jean-Paul stress, perhaps that's not the key question. The key question is, I think, uh, at least one or more uh, uh, speakers or questioners this morning pointed out is the key is to enhance the dialogue and make sure it's rich and back and forth so that we mutually benefit from each other's insights and ensure that, um, that we inside this institution are hearing from those who are right now largely outside of it. So I'll open to the floor, and I may not have Alessandro, others. Uh, I will come to you in a second, but I want to give my uh, colleague from Canada a chance in the spirit of cross-fertilization between panels, uh, the chance to speak as well. Thank you very much, Stuart, uh, and thank you to the panelists. My question, I have two questions. I'll let you answer them as you wish. If you could please pull up slide 12 on the big screen, and just keeping in mind slide 50 and slide 12. If you could go to slide 12, um, International Bureau. This was a slide that was presented, uh, I know you're still getting there. It's a slide that was presented by uh, Walter during the presentation made by the consultative committee. Sorry, it looks like it's a bulky switch. And I think 50 is the one we're about to come to, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just kind of bouncing between slide 50 and slide 12. Just as we're pulling up that slide, um, Walter, in that slide, in that pictogram, you had the consultative committee reporting to the POC, and you had the consultative committee reporting to the CA. That's the slide. And in the slide, you don't have to switch to slide 50, but in slide 50, the question is, who does the CC report to? So if you could clarify what the intent of this slide was, where you show sort of a dual reporting, but then later on in the presentation, we talk about, well, where should the CC point? It appears from that slide 12 that the CC functionally does feed into the work of both councils. So that's my first question. The second question actually draws on what Muhammad had to say, but also draws on a comment made by the representative from the government of the Netherlands, I believe. It was either the regulator or the ministry in a discussion about a year and a half ago when he said the following. He said something to the effect of, form should follow function. And so if we look at the way that the CC does its work, I'm wondering if we really should pay more attention to the function part and try to come up with some ideas on how proposals that go from the POC and from the CA to Congress should go through. So those of us who work in government are very familiar with doing um, business impact tests, gender-based analysis impact tests. Um, some jurisdictions do impact tests based on the impact on youth or the socioeconomically vulnerable. Is it possible to retain the intergovernmental character of the UPU while at the same time having the CC report to both councils as indicated in slide 12, but also formalizing analytical lenses we use for Congress proposals to say, have concerns from the CC been met? What did we use as sort of the test criteria before the document even hits, before the ink hits the paper? I wonder if we can start looking at more clever policy-based and regulatory-based approaches that maybe deformalize it, but make it extremely effective at the front end. Thank you. I hope my question was clear. Let me know if it wasn't. No, that, thank you, Raj. That was very clear. And before I turn it over to Walter, I think that comes back to the point we made earlier in the presentation about whether a referral process is appropriate. And then um, I did not share the points from our survey, but there was an extent, those of you who responded will remember that there were extensive questions about which areas uh, wider sector players should have the ability to play a role. And that really gets to your question about whether uh, reporting to both councils is appropriate. But with that, I'll turn it over to you, Walter. Thank you. Um, Raj, thank you very much for bringing up slide 12. Uh, that slide is actually used uh, for um, answering questions uh, coming from the wider sector players possibly interested 
in the CC. Um, um, and uh, it reflects uh, the current reality that we are actually trying to engage as much as we can with both CA and POC. Yeah? Um, we established that more or less informally, yeah? but it works very well. And uh, the purpose is to draw on the expertise and knowledge of our new members and establish that kind of knowledge transfer where it is, the knowledge I mean, um, to, to those standing councils. Um, it comes a little bit back to, to what I said um, earlier today uh, when I said, well, we know that we have to qualify ourselves to be recognized by certain bodies. Yes, um, basically to sit there and basically listen and, and do nothing is, is no input. <laughs> Um, so, so we want to be relevant and uh, we need to have that structure in place. Um, when it then comes uh, to, to whom should we report, well, in the end, the decision making, like Jean-Paul said, um, is, is the government's. <laughs> yeah? um, so so um, in the end, uh, the government's, because they are the members, will have to qualify if whatever the CC or POC is, is bringing up is, is up to what has been decided as a deliverable. Um, so so that, that's the background of, of this chart. It, uh, it, is, it is a chart to explain how we are trying to develop our relationships yeah, and does not reflect the official charts used, used on our homepage. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Did anyone else have a comment? No? Uh, well, let me, I think we have requests from Pranoy and David and um, Vincenzo, but I think Pranoy was first. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, and thank you for addressing the question uh, uh, raised by India about the dominant players. Still, uh, uh, it, it, uh, the taste of pudding is in eating, so we can only visualize if when some dominant players become member of the CC or so. So what would be the scenario? But we see that uh, across and uh, our domestic sector al already. So uh, you know, having said that, uh, um, about the reporting structure, uh, I, I understand that there should not be much of issue as uh, also pointed out by Joe Paul. And uh, any even uh, in, in, in questionnaire also, it was mentioned how the decision making uh, process is there in different uh, uh, countries and whether the stakeholders are involved. And the result of survey also indicate, yes, they are involved in most of the cases, but having uh, not the say in final decision making. And uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I can give an uh, example of India Post, wherever a major policy coming or so, we have to put it on the, on the website for the wider sector consultation and how to take into account whatever uh, the inputs are there, and that is for across the ministries. So that process is there, and th those are addressed and again put uh, with the responses for the public domain, but final decision ultimately it is of the government how it is coming out to be. So uh, th this is in across in many countries uh, uh, established process, and here uh, if uh, it, it through comes through reporters or otherwise through POC and ultimate approvals and uh, that comes from the CA. So I don't see any contradiction there uh, coming out. So uh, that is, I think, uh, very much uh, an, uh, a process which is established and can further be refined. The second point wanted to mention about also touched by John Paul about the financial services. And we have for quite a few time uh, reminded this that already like multilateral agreement or the membership of the postal payment services user group, a uh, number of products which are already there uh, are, are, we have been given the KPIs and the deliverables to make wider sector players along with DOs members and to sign those uh, the multilateral agreement. So it is, uh, it can be a laboratory or an uh, uh, initially stage, let the financial services, we are already there. So who are the wider sector players can come and integrate and once they sign a uh, multilateral agreement and the user group, they become part of uh, institutional integration uh, with the union. Thank you. Thank you, Pranoy. That's very interesting and insightful. And, um, uh, and thank you for bringing up the point that I admitted that part of the rationale for the approach we 
adopted of the enhanced CC is that it mirrors what countries do nationally. And you've described India's case, actually it's the same in the United States for international postal policy. We consult wider postal sector players as well, but at the end of the day, it's a government decision. Um, I think um, I, we have David, then Vincenzo, and I think Mr. Hu from China wants to follow up as well, but I think David wanted to go to slide 52, so if we could put that up, please. Oh, actually, can we start at 12 and then go to 50 and then 52? Oh, okay. Let's go to stay at 12. Yeah. I mean, the point I wanted to make is I, the consultative committee um, should, I, I think, should report to both. If it really depends on what the issue is. If it's a government issue, it should be reporting to the CA. And if it's an operational issue, it should report to the POC. So if we go to slide deck 50 now, uh, you know, the, I don't know, okay. So if you look in the right, the blue box, it says enhanced CC, and then it's got the three, three bodies, CA, POC, and it's got the CC. The CC, after all, it's a consultative body. It doesn't have any voting rights. So the fact that in this slide it appears under the Congress is not in itself significant. One way you could modify this organogram, this organizational chart, is to have dotted line relationship going under the CC, under the chart, and then going one up to the PC, POC, and another dotted line going into the CA. I mean, that would capture the idea that they are putting in their advice to both the POC and the CA, depending on what the nature is, whether it's a consulta excuse me, an organizational issue or, or, excuse me, operational issue or a governance issue. If we could go to 52, I would appreciate that. Now, I thought this was a very, very interesting slide. Um, if we look at the, the first box that's brown, which my eyesight is so bad I have to switch between glasses here. Okay, it says, was not accepted through a consultative opinion that the CA and the POC bodies shall consider the CC opinion before making any decisions on related issues. Now in English, the word shall is a very significant legal term, which means must. It's a clear obligation. Now, if you said may, that means it's a, sort of an option. You don't have to. I think that, I mean, let's realistically speaking, the CC doesn't have any voting rights, but it has opinions which may be valuable. So if you change the language to something that said something like, uh, the CC may send through the IB to the CA and POC, uh, their views respectively on governance and operational issues for their consideration by the CA or POC. That doesn't create an obligation for the CA or the POC to consider it, but it does give a right to the CC to send via the secretariat, via the IB, this information for the consideration. So the POC could say, well, this is interesting, we want to discuss it, or the POC could say, well, we, valuable, but you know, we don't necessarily need to discuss it. So it would give the, the CA and the POC the right to choose whether they wanted to consult it or not, or use it or not, but yet it would give the CC the right to send this information. So I think, I mean, that's one way. I don't see why member countries or the regulators or the designated operators would object to a change in language that along those lines, uh, so that the CC had the right to send the information but the CA or the POC could choose whether or not they wanted to actually use it. And just a, just a small suggestion. Thank you, David. Uh, that's a very, very interesting suggestion. I, I think the thought of the transformation proposal at the time it was developed before Abidjan was to try to put uh, make it more of a requirement so that it was certain that the CC would be consulted and that CC members uh, felt in a way that would enhance their value in the organization and ensure they had a voice. Um, and uh, Siva, I believe you have a point. Thanks very much, uh, Stuart. And just to try and give the context of this particular slide. So this slide tries to capture 
uh, a range of proposals that were made by the CC uh, to the task force, the then task force during the last cycle. Um, and it indicates which elements of that package of proposals were accepted and those that weren't. And, and so one of the things that the CC had proposed was to move away from the status quo, which is really about, they, they already have the opportunity to put forward papers to the different committees, different councils, and, and so on. And, and, the, and those papers can be considered rejected or ignored. But what I think the CC was proposing to the task force of the last cycle was to sort of make it a bit more mandatory. That is to say, we, we, we've gone to the trouble of actually pulling together some thoughts, some ideas, some contributions to the debate. We would like the committee or the council concerned to actually give this some thought and, and, and take a formal decision whether to incorporate some of those ideas or to reject it. And, and so that, I think, was the intention. Uh, but member states in their considered opinion didn't think it relevant at that point. So the real question for us is in the, in, in, in the next generation of the CC, is this something that we should re-look at and, and consider? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Siva. Um, I'll, John Paul, your comment, oui. please. Yes, if I could just come in there. I understand what David is saying. And in fact, I'd like to reassure you, David, whatever happens when there is a request or a demand of any kind, it is studied. The question is raised in any event and it is debated. So, even if you look at the status quo, I think it does afford some protection, even as things stand. Now, as for the whole issue of the way in which the CC is going to feed into this working group, well, there are umpteen ways of doing that. You could, for instance, give a paper with opinions to a group that might be a closed group. You could grant somebody the status of observer, either as a standing observer, or you could have someone from the CC going to raise a particular topic and then withdrawing to allow people to continue to discuss the matter among themselves in a particular group. There's, there's so many different ways of doing this. And I think we're going to have to learn as we go on this a bit. Because there's all sorts of things that might happen. And if you talk about opening up by force, as it were, compelled or compulsory opening up, then you will, you'll end up with a situation where, in fact, because it's been opened up, people only talk about banal things in the meeting room and the real decisions are going to be made outside when people talk among themselves outside of the meeting. That's what they'll do if they feel that opening up has been forced upon them. So I do think we have to keep our minds very open as to all the possible ways of achieving what we want to achieve here. We want the members of the CC to come along with things that they can bring to the table, that they can feed in. We don't want them just standing there looking on. We want them actually to be involved, to be doing things, to challenge us and make us move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jean-Paul. Uh, that's a helpful point as well. Um, I think Vincenzo had a comment, perhaps. I'm not sure if you still do or uh, very quick. Well, I, I had two comments, but the first was already resolved by uh, David and Jean-Paul answer, so for me it's clear and I agree completely with what Jean-Paul said. There was another <coughs> sentence by uh, Walter, but I don't know if we have to deal with it in this panel, which was uh, related to the cooperation. He said, uh, namely, there seems to be a lot of benefits. Um, well, apart from the verbal uh, sentence. Well, uh, can you elaborate better those benefits uh, are related to? Oh, you don't remember what you said that? Uh, Otherwise, I mean... Benefits in, in what kind of connection? <laughs> uh, you were uh, talking about the cooperation between stakeholders and the design operators. Yeah. Uh, you said there seems to be a lot of benefits. Can you elaborate better that? Or Absolutely. Was just a, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, benefits, because we are living in a very diverse, highly complex, fully digital environment. 
um, and uh, some of the new members are very much engaged with the whole sector. That might be the designated operators, but that's also the private operators. Um, serving them, helping them in, in certain specific topics, which are at the heart to be solved by designated operators right now. None of the designated operators can solve those problems alone. They need third parties helping them. And, and, and these are benefits which are coming um, into the UPU. Yeah? Um, and, uh, and, and those operators, mainly IT operators, uh, machine learning operators, yeah, those guys, yeah? they are coming yeah? and they're, they're doing two things. Either they're offering their services, but they have to compl be compliant and certified and audited by the UPU. Yeah? They are only allowed to play if, if they're in, in line. Yeah? They have to dance according to our tune and not to their tune. Yeah? To, to make that very blunt. Um, the other point is, they also have enormous expertise. And because they are op operating in some countries with certain special regulations, yeah, and they can give that expertise directly to us and help the customs group and help the transport group because they are directly interacting there. And they are willing to do that. But again, this comes un under the umbrella, I said, yeah, <laughs> we have to prove that this is really true now. Yeah? And, and that's the structure we are trying to, to put in place. Thank you. Thanks for is that good, Vincenzo? Great. Um, before I come to Nermeen, I think we had a request for the floor from China. So, uh, Mr. Hu, I'll give you the floor. We have attempted to answer your two questions regarding what an enhanced CC might mean and where it might report. Uh, but we would welcome your thoughts or to, um, uh, as well on, on uh, how you think that might be approached. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a pleasure to hear many different comments from uh, our dear colleagues. I would like to come back to my question in the morning. That is how to understand uh, and enhance the CC. So uh, uh, according to my understanding, uh, now, uh, new members of CC have been approved. And uh, uh, we have now, now there are 13 new members. And also six thematic chapters have been established. I think that's already uh, a kind of uh, enhanced CC. So I think the point is we believe the reform should give priority to enhance the function of CC. And that can promote the uh, cooperation and uh, interconnections with, uh, with DOs or with POCs. So we do not think uh, uh, now it's, uh, we have any uh, drastic need to uh, to upgrade CC parallel to CA or POC. So that's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful to understand your view. And I uh, welcome other views from around the world, uh, the room, uh, world too, since we're online as well. But um, uh, that's a very good point. When we talk about an enhanced CC, we're really uh, talking about an enhanced CC plus because we shouldn't give short shrift to, to what we did in Abidjan. We already have made changes that have brought, uh, that have brought the new dynamism that uh, Walter has highlighted with the new members. And really the organizational changes he's made uh, and that the CC has adopted uh, with the thematic chapters, I think will allow much more structured and fruitful interaction. Um, so again, I, and I, I did want to, as I said, the mea culpa at the start, the slide um, depicting the CC as equivalent to the, to the CA uh, uh, and POC was not intended to be definitive. That was for our deliberation. And I think, you know, we're hearing that a reporting relationship to both councils is, is necessary, is appropriate, depending on the subject. I think that, that point was made 
but that it's also understood that uh, the role remains consultative as in the name and that as an intergovernmental organization, um, it is um, governments that will continue to make the decisions. I mean, uh, John Paul has, has made the point that the POC was to uh, include operational expertise that DOs represent, but it is, still uh, it is still governments in member countries that are represented in the POC as they are in the CA. So we have a multi-step process there where governments validate all the decisions that we make. Um, looking around the room, who have I met? Uh, Nermeen, I'm sorry, i come back to you. It's okay, Stuart, you're doing great. Uh, I have a comment on, uh, uh, and question from Mr. Trezek uh, for the point he clarified upon uh, Finchens' question on the values can be presented through the CC. Because these are the same requests of the wider Boston sector plays from our Boston network. They are looking for the standard developed by the network. And they are, uh, and as, uh, uh, as Catherine said today, but the BTC has developed great solutions that can be used by wider Boston sector players. So the values you are talking about that can be presented from the CC, CC members are already requested by the wider Boston sector players. So I, I believe there is none. And if, if, if my understanding is not right, please correct me. Thanks, Jermaine. That's a, that's a very interesting question. I think there's a feeling they felt they could contribute in the development of those standards that from their outside perspective, they've got their separate networks. Keith has highlighted some of their things they do with USPS in the US. But Walter, you're more of an expert on this area than obviously than I am, so. Yes, my favorite topic, standardization, has been mentioned, yes. <laughs> um, standardization is at, at the core of all this. Yeah? And, and now I might shock you again. Um, the UPU is not an internationally recognized standardization body. Yeah? Um, so, so what's currently happening, and I give you a very good example, um, is that um, standardization bodies like ISO, SEN, the European Standardization Committee, ETSI, yeah, ITU, yeah, uh, they, are, they are creating standards. <clears throat> um, uh, in the European context, we do what we can, creating standards for the fully liberalized postal market to be as open as possible, yeah, with the involvement of all stakeholders. Uh, when it comes to the UPU, we currently ensure that those standards in Europe created are aligned with the UPU. The worst thing would be that they are drifting apart. Yeah. So, um, again, these, these standards are now started to be much more recognized uh, because they are the basis of creating business. And um, in a highly digital environment, this is paramount. Um, therefore, therefore it, um, what's currently happening is that a lot of wider postal sector players in Europe are now drawing to these postal standards, which uh, to a certain extent I think even 80% of those postal standards are already directly related to the use of data. Um, electronic advanced data is our ac acronym for that. Um, and, uh, and they're also bridging between, uh, between UPU-related standards and also linking into the European data-related environment. Now, the best example is electronic advanced data from the UPU-designated operators linking into the European customs data model. They're not the same. They're complementing each other. Um, and, and we need to map that. Yeah? So, so these things are coming. Um, when I then talk about the wider postal sector players, they know that yeah? because they are, already have the experience to bridge between them. And this is a lot of value. Yeah? Um, also, also for the PTC because the PTC, by definition, is running on, on these UPU specifications, which they call standards because they are standards when it comes to the whole community here, um, when it's only designated operators. So, so these things are happening. Yeah? So it's highly complex, yes, yeah? but it works. And, um, and uh, to develop those standards further, yeah? so, so what are the next line of standards? It's product uh, safety, yeah? transport security, sustainability, um, all that kind of harmonization for the whole sector. We will need the wider sector players 
um, to come up with solutions directly interconnected. This is partly a governance problem and partly an operational problem. There's another question. <laughs> John Paul wanted to come and also brief it. Oui, c'est vrai qu'on pourrait faire l'après-midi sur les normes. Yes, it's true. We could spend the whole afternoon on standards. And we certainly have someone who knows the subject inside out on the panel. But I do want to add just one brief comment. What you say is true, officially, formally. When we talk about standards, well, in fact, what we do here is is not really to work on standards, as the word standards is understood internationally. What we do is we promote interoperability rules that apply among ourselves. Yeah, we call them standards, but they're not exactly standards. It's true that elsewhere people do do standards. Now, interconnection is a topic that really is a very dangerous one. And if you start talking about it, you're on a very, very slippery slope. In fact, you might even describe yourself as being in a minefield because everyone's trying to promote their own interests. People want to keep their customers. They want to try to make sure that their subcontractors work with them and only them. They want to try to control things as much as possible. Everyone wants to do that. Now, I know that there was actually a time where in Europe, within the CEN, I've kind of lost track of when this was, but there was a time when there was a lot of reluctance about putting in place standards for interconnection. And the people who were most against it were private operators because they didn't want customers to be able to switch easily from one to another because sometimes standards actually protect the customers. They can even be seen as being a bit protectionist in some cases. So, and this really is my last comment on this. It's all very well to say that there may be standards that are adopted somewhere else in the world, but let's not end up with ICS2 here again. Because if we're going to end up in a situation where we have to respect CEN standards in Europe and then other standards somewhere else for ASEAN and then some different set of standards for Mercosur, then we're not going to make our lives easier. In fact, we're going to do quite the opposite. I just wanted to add that comment to what Walter has said. But as I say, he knows an awful lot more about this than I do. Thank you. Paul, well, that's a fascinating point about interconnection and a reminder of the complexities we've discussed in the POC about uh, different regional uh, standards that are emerging. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Nirmeen, you wanted to follow up. Uh, sorry, Stuart, but uh, again, for comment for uh, Mr. Trezek's uh, response. Actually, the standard board is open and sen attends the meetings. And what you said is happening right now. Uh, there have been alignment for developing uh, motor standards for whatever happened in Europe. We are not part of Europe and we're not interested in the standards that designed especially for Europe. But we are a member of standard board and we are engaged in this work and we know one single fact. It is efficient for the interoperability among 192 member countries. And we don't need to be like issuing standard body to, to, to be something, you know. It is efficient and it is a base for good technology that interconnects this integrated supply chain that already uh, uh, has uh, responded to the requirements of AED and has responded for the customs authority based on regulation of Kyoto Convention and whatever is given to the Boston regulation. So it already exists here. So the standard board is open, so the UP is not that closed. So that's my point, and thank you so much uh, for your response. Thanks. I think we'll leave it there and see if we have other questions. Vincenzo wants to speak. Raj, were you asking for the floor earlier, or did I, did I mistake it? I was, but if others are looking for the floor, I'm happy to see it until uh, the pace slows down. It's a good discussion. That's very generous, and we'll, so we'll hold you and Vincenzo. Let me look around the room to see if there's anyone else. Uh, we have some others in the room we have not heard from yet, so I want to make sure you have a chance to speak. I've decided not to channel my inner Oprah Winfrey and we'll walk around with a mic and force you to, so since we're having a lively enough discussion anyway. 
Well, let's, uh, Raj, go back to you then. And I think we will finish up uh, shortly because I think we left a lot of things hanging um, in the second panel. And I think we really need to get to the discussion on um, products and services. We've seen it's interrelated uh, as some of the points Nermeen made about the standards board, I think are, are relevant to our discussion of products and services, but Raj, please. Okay, so my, my question is for Mohammed, and I, I wanna give you a, a bit of a hard time here, my friend. Um, if I were, when I, when I was working in, in regulatory affairs, one of the things that we would look for, one of the things that we were very mindful of was industry capturing processes or industry capture on regulatory processes. And so when we we're having this discussion on an enhanced CC, and we see the hard work that Walter has done in growing the CC membership, we see Kate earlier in the session was talking about the growing IMAG membership, and that's a good thing. These groups becoming more robust and attracting uh, a wide range of players within their rank and file, that's, that's a great thing. It creates critical mass. But it also can create a problem when super large partners come on board and they tend to dominate the discussion. And because their interests are of a scale that are so large and they have the resources to pursue them, sometimes extremely aggressively, it is very possible if we do enhance the powers of the CC or any other entity that would feed into the CA and or the POC, as a regulator or as a former person working in regulations, I would think there's an opportunity for industry capture of processes. And when these entities feed into everything from changes in regulations, changes in really in anything, there's a possibility that large interests can swamp out small interests and that specific interests can play perhaps a stronger role than they ought to. So given that you're a regulator, and I know that we're, we've got a number of people in this room that are serving in regulatory functions, I'm curious on whether there's something in the back of your mind that just, that your spidey sense is tingling, that you're just, there's something that worries you. I'm very curious on what your thoughts on that, are on that particular matter of large interests, maybe playing a bit more of an influence than they would under a current structure where there are very intergovernmentally based checks and balances. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to take that, sir. Yeah, Raj, uh, it's quite a long question. I think you answered a bit of your old questions. I don't mind if you answer the question. Okay. Yeah. I think the first one, maybe my answer is, the government, I believe, is not knowing all the things nowadays. <laughs> no government have the answer for all the problems. I think that's number one. I think that's why we need a wider stakeholders engagement. I think that is the underlying reason. If the government knows all the answers, we don't need all the stakeholders discussion. We can decide tomorrow. We can solve all the humanity problem tomorrow. Because the government do not really know how to solve a problem. So we need to gather, get the information, get the feedbacks. And some of the solutions or decision of the government, not necessarily the correct decision most of the time. <laughs> some of the time, government make wrong problem, wrong decision as well. And there is a way for us to change some of the wrong decision. I think this is a feedback loops uh, a process. But the thing is, we cannot stop from not making decisions. I think that is something that we need to think. Sometimes, because the problem is too much, we prefer to KIV most of the time, most of the problem. I think this is not something that uh, is good for, for UPU in particular. Talking about the risk, I think UPU, I think we have put enough uh, control we have sufficient committees, I think, to have the check and balance. I think you got the points. I also want to even raise some of my concern in 4CC as well, because there is a potential that is going to be dominated by a big vendors, whatnot. I think CC also, I think, think the same way. 
I think there must be mechanisms. How can we address that one? I have no answer for that one, but I think you got you bring a good point, and I think this is something that we need to think as well. Uh, I think yeah, I think that is my 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 point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saidi. That's very helpful, and I think that comes back to. Um to the question we asked Walter earlier about market dominant players and their potential role. And just again, in the spirit of cross-fertilization, Raj, and you mentioned IMAG and Kate, and I think going back to the question, I believe it was Bice that asked, from Ghana asked it of her at the end of, of your panel, you know, asking if the members of IMAG were the same as some of the large courier companies. Um, I think they are. She can answer better than I can, but I think it's, distinct sub-entities of, of those big courier companies. So, um, I mean, she's better placed to answer that than I am. Keith is as well, but I think a lot of these big companies are not monoliths. They have a lot of different entities that, so if they were here, it, it might not mean that they were here as the totality, but it might be one uh, subsection. Um, we have to finish up now and um, we, let me go to one more slide, uh, to the slides at the end. Uh, let's, yeah, we've already done this. Um, uh, and yeah, go back one more. Oh, I'm sorry, Yori Takai, I didn't see you up there. I was looking at the slide. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Stuart, uh, for giving the floor. So uh, this is not a question uh, from me, but uh, I'd like to uh, express my uh, very general view uh, with regard to our work on the stream, uh, <coughs> work stream one. So uh, my view is, uh, I think it is uh, almost correspond to the view expressed by uh, Walter. So uh, we recognize that our objective in the opening up is to maximize benefits of the postal sector. Uh, in doing so, we believe it is important for us to carefully listen to voices from all the possible stakeholders, both in the CA and the POC, uh, in a very balanced manner. As currently, the postal market is relevant with many other markets. We need to have a holistic view to make the postal sector sustainable and more prosperous. It is not our way forward to scramble for the pie in the wider postal market. We should find a good way forward where DOs and WSPS collaborate for their mutual benefits by extending their own knowledge, expertise, and, uh, uh, and technological solutions that is conducive to uh, developing improved and innovative services, as well as expanding the pie for the relevant market. The UPU can provide an effective hub for such collaboration, which we believe is conducive to ensuring fiscal sustainability uh, of the UPU as well. And uh, we, of course, yeah, uh, as long as we can achieve a mutually beneficial relationship among stakeholders, uh, we are open to any organizational structure to be decided by member countries uh, in the future, perhaps uh, hopefully in the next uh, year's extraordinary Congress. So, but this is just my personal view, but uh, thank you for listening to my intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Yoritaka. That's much appreciated, and we will reflect on that as well. I think we have one last um, request for the floor from Papu, and I'm not sure where Chief Moyo is. Ah, there you are. Yes. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for sitting the floor to Papu as an observer in this uh, uh, meeting. And uh, Chair, you will agree with me, I've held back my arrows the whole day, and I'm trying to come with a something slightly new uh, for, for consideration by, by the members. And I, I've looked at uh, the proposals for the reporting uh, by the enhanced uh, CC. And uh, to me, the issue really uh, it has to be reduced to something like a simultaneous equation if we are talking mathematics. And uh, I'm trying to look at uh, the setup in a, in a particular country where we have three distinct layers. The government as the policy maker, the regulator 
or regulatory authority as uh, overseeing the uh, functioning of the sector. And then we have the players, and the players are uh, the designated operator and the private players. These roles are very clear. At country level, there is no stampede for policy making by uh, players, and uh, the regulator is not challenged in terms of uh, his roles and responsibilities. Then I take that, you know, with the computers you can cut and paste. I have cut, I'm trying to paste it here at the UPU uh, level, where the UPU is an intergovernmental organization, intergovernmental organization. And uh, therefore, at the highest level, we have Congress where government sits. And now I'm trying to see where we need, where I need to paste the enhanced uh, uh, CC. And uh, I am persuaded, uh, the Chairman, to say that uh, for consistency and avoiding capture of roles or functions, there is need for a clear distinction between what uh, uh, enhanced CC or what POC can do. It's not, it's not more a question of who they report to, but what they can do, the powers that they have. POC uh, deals with uh, commercial issues. They do not have powers to change the convention, powers to change the treaty. And I would want to uh, promote that kind of approach when we are dealing with uh, uh, having uh, the enhanced CC. We definitely need them but we need them to play their role. We all cannot play one role. We all cannot be goalkeepers. Some have to be strikers, some defenders, some sitting on the bench. And I believe we have to find a way of uh, striking that balance. I see the floor back to you, Chairman. Thank you, Chief Moyo. That also is a very thoughtful intervention uh, that we will keep in mind. And I think it tracks with the discussion we've heard today that this is an intergovernmental organization. It is governments that will re remain sovereign and make the decisions. It's a question of how we best get the input, the expertise that consultative committee members, wider sector players bring to us. And um, I take your point that perhaps we've talked, I think, during our discussion that the P, um, CC would be able to provide input to both councils. Um, I think, as you suggest, probably in practice, uh, there would be more items that would link them with the POC than the CA, since we often in the CA here deal with governmental matters rather than operational postal ones. But uh, they would still have the ability to provide input. Um, I'm going to sum up in a minute, but uh, before I do that, I wanted to thank all of you for um, your interventions. I would also like to invite you to send to the task force secretariat um, any summary of your interventions that you would like to make, just so we could have it in record. We have notes, obviously, but if you want to provide it to us in more detail, that would be appreciated. Again, Chatham House rules, if you don't want us to say who it came from, we'll just say the comment was made. But again, all this input has been extremely valuable, and uh, I, we think we've got it down, but if you want to send us something to ensure we've absolutely got it correct, that would be great. Uh, before I do the summary, just these slides, I don't think we have time to get into the issue of, of what this is part of what the obligation of wider sector members might be in exchange for whatever benefits they receive from the consultative committee or ultimately from the separate discussion we're going to have on products and services. But I just recommend we all think about um, the new system that Walter talked about that the consultative committee has introduced. And going to the next slide, um, just questions to reflect on in the future. Perhaps we'll come back to these in a task force meeting. Uh, it may be premature to consider these right now in line with China's comments on other elements of the membership changes um, and whether those need to be revisited. You know, should there be a fixed fee? Um, should there be charges to access some uh, or all products and services? 
and how do we recover investments made so far in developing products and services? And to play devil's advocate, if, if we're an intergovernmental organization, should we try to recover the investments uh, made in those products and services? Because at the end of the day, it's governments that made those investments and uh, you know, governments represent the totality of the sector. Um, DOs are an important part of that, enabling us to carry out our functions under the acts of the union. But we all recognize that uh, we also, uh, the wider sector players are under us too. So um, I'm just going to, a couple key points I think uh, the takeaways we've taken from this meeting is, as I said, inputs to both councils uh, should be possible. Uh, we have to decide how formal that should be in line with what uh, one questioner asked. It could be required, it could be shall, or it could be may. Uh, we have to think about that. Um, we need to consider um, effective engagement at the working level and what the appropriate level, uh, starting point for that working level is. You know, We have had attendance and participation in councils. We've heard, I think, that there has perhaps been less participation in working groups. And uh, though I take Nermeen's point that the standards board, among others, has been open and has, has had input. Uh, we had a whole series about, of questions about uh, dealing with dominance and capture within the CC, and that uh, is something we will have to deal with prospectively. We don't have any market dominant players right now. We may have some on the horizon. So that is something we'll have to uh, remain in tune to. And then finally, just participation across the board. So um, you, in summing up, I'd just say finally, uh, you know, we have um, a clear path forward that we're going to recommend uh, to the CA tomorrow. And if the CA agrees, we will pursue the route of an enhanced CC. But that doesn't mean our work's done. We've still got a lot to do. The devil will be in the details and trying to figure out all of these elements so that we can create a package that responds to the needs of the wider sector, that respects the concern of all the stakeholders here. Uh, so thank you all for your uh, active engagement today. And uh, I think we're going to take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, um, 10 minutes. So try to be back here at 4.30 uh, so that uh, you can grill uh, our participants on panel two. and. Uh, as Raj suggested for us, I hope you've got your knife sharpened. So.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you can uh, please get over to your desks or chairs, or if you're standing because you've been sitting too long, we'll get started here in, uh, in a minute or two. So ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats and we will get started. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I, th I think we're good to go. International Bureau, are we okay to start? Yeah, we're okay to start. Peter, we're okay to start? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. We're going to pick up here with this second session dealing with products and services. Now, just so that we have a good understanding of what the actual products and services are, we have, uh, the, under the CAC2, there was an expert team that was comprised of the team leaders or the leaders which were Austria and Uruguay and so for the purpose of walking us through the various products and services that were examined we have a presentation by Peter Kohler from Austria so Peter please uh, walk us through uh, the products and services we'll be looking at the floor is yours Thank you very much, Raj. Um, first of all, let me start with two observations. Normally, I really hate it when, when people thank each other because I think um, time is wasted um, heavily, in particular with some UPU meetings. But I've made two observations. Um, the first observation is that the quality of slides of the UPU has increased tremendously. The second observation is that I also think the mood regarding such discussions we are having today um, has changed a lot and really improved and I find it very fruitful listening to all of you and, and having such um, insightful and, as I said, fruitful discussions. So thank you everyone who is responsible for that. May it be the moderators, may it be the one who created a new PowerPoint template. Um, thank you very much. This is really um, well noted. Um, regarding um, our work when it comes to the expert team of opening up products and services, basically everything is written on this wonderful slide here anyway. Um, what we're doing, um, we're trying to have technical reviews of three different baskets. The first basket is the one which consists of products which have already made accessible since the Istanbul cycle. And with this basket, we're going to discover why those services and products have not been used and what we might be able to do better in the future in order to make those products are relevant for wider postal sector players. With basket two and three, it's a little bit different as these um, products and services, they have not been opened yet. And here we ask ourselves the question, what um, shall we focus on? What might be impact assessments? What might be rules of opening certain products and services? And um, this is kind of a little bit of a painstaking um, work, to be honest with you. In the beginning, it, it was kind of overwhelming because we're dealing with 22 different products and services. We've produced 110 pages so far, which is a very, very um, long um, read, to be honest with you. I can, I, I can only um, ask you to, to have a read. It, it, some, some things are, are very interested. Some things, honestly, to be honest with you, they can be quite boring, but, but overall um, we've produced a, a huge um, document so far, which um, serves as the basis for every discussion we're going to have in the upcoming months. Um, as I said, um, 110 pages so far and 22 um, products we have analyzed. Next slide, please. And this is already going to be my, my last slide. We're going to jump into um, the exact and individual products and services in the upcoming slides anyway. There's four things I would like to note. 
The first um, thing is that um, we have received lots of general comments which um, they, they are all right, but they don't move the discussion forward. So the more specific any comments are, the better is, it is for our work to move forward and develop something together. Um, the second um, thing is that um, just by analyzing the direct injection model, Kate and Keith kind of um, were, were proposing um, this, this morning, it, it makes you realize that you have to have a very holistic approach towards this exercise. You can't have a look at all these products and services on an individual basis. So that's what we're going to have in the future, a more holistic approach and try to bundle things um, together um, in order to to have products and services, which makes sense. For example, um, if you look at one product, which is UPU clearing, it doesn't make any sense um, to have a wider postal sector player have access to UPU clearing, clearing without having access to, to any other system or product. The third thing I'd, I'd like to note, um, so far with every single document, um, we have realized and gotten the feedback that it doesn't make sense to talk about things without a proper impact analysis. We haven't had any single impact analysis or market analysis so far. If anyone ever has something, has already produced it, will produce it, please share it um, as soon as possible, although there is still a couple of months um, time as we see this as a process which will go on for um, many more months. And the fourth um, point, and this is my, my, my final note I'd like to make, um, no matter what the impact or the input might be, um, what, whatever um, feedback you want to give us, anyone out there, any state, any regulator, any wider postal sector player, any, any designated operators, please provide your feedback. Um, it is really, really appreciated. I see this work as personally very, very interesting. It gives you kind of the feeling of, of strategic and product management, and we only can succeed if we do this together on a global basis. So thank you very much. We're going to get into more detail um, now with you, Rajan and Namin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. So I, I have a question before we move into the slide. So we've got the next slide up. Uh, I think we need to be on slide 64. My question for you, ladies and gentlemen, and this is not to name and shame it's not to embarrass, it's just in the spirit of understanding what kind of discussion we're going to have. I, I, I was a university professor for 10 years and, and so this is sort of, who did the readings? So when we look at CAC2 2022.2 DOC2A and DOC2B, who did the reading? 109 pages, put your hands up please. Okay, if I... <laughs> So, <laughs> it's a good reading. So I, <laughs> what's that? What's that? <laughs> but the point we need to make is, ladies and gentlemen, again, we have an extraordinary Congress that's coming up in October of next year. And it is so important for all of you as, as member countries and representatives of that debate to really understand what are the actual products that we're dealing with. What are the actual services we are dealing with? How do they interrelate with each other? Who is asking for them to be opened up and for what reason? And if we don't have a common understanding, even within this house, it becomes very difficult to invite others to come in the house if we ourselves aren't speaking the same language. So I know... Now, who does that Canada guy think he is telling us what to do? You can't tell me what to do. No, it's not that. I'm encouraging you to become educated on the work. It's 109 pages, but it's not dense reading. But they do provide you with a very clear understanding of what we're actually talking about when we talk about products and services. There's additional reading that provides you with member country specific and organization specific inputs. And so you can see, what did IMAG say about this? What did China say about this? What did the US say about this? What did Canada say? Spain, France, et cetera. So uh, those are all available. And I would encourage you when we sort of get some momentum here with this conference and we come back at S3 and we're, we're looking at proposals for Congress, it's very important for you to understand this. So on this first slide, uh, when we think about the products and services that we're talking about, you'll recall that they were divided into three baskets. Basket one, two, three. 
The first basket of products and services were approved at the 2016 Istanbul Congress for opening to the wider postal sector. We see in the second basket, there's a number of very interesting proposals that deal with access to the IP Secretariat for a range of services. And that's, it's, it's one of those between basket one and basket three. That's where the majority of the attention seems to be focused, but we don't really ever get into a robust discussion of the ins and outs and pros and cons of basket two. So we'll put the IV on the hot seat as well, even though they're neutral facilitators, we'll see if we can squeeze some juice out of the lemon there. And then basket three, of course, is sometimes in performance discussions inside our organization, we call them stretch objectives. So what are we, where can we go down the road if we're thinking about not just interoperability or you know, working together in an integrated fashion, but we think about where does the future take us and what might that look like? If there's a discussion there, great. If you have concerns about it, air them. If you have a particular affinity for one or a few of them, air it. And if you hate it, Tell us that too. Let's go to the next slide. So we can structure, sorry, members here can structure your questions and your comments and how you want to engage based on asking a couple of sort of three basic questions. The first is under that demand vertical column, which is, and perhaps this is a good question for our partners that are coming from outside the tent, so to speak is that what are the products and services that you want and how do we bundle them? The second vertical might be a question that we also discussed, which is under what terms and conditions do we open specific products and services? And when we talk about access models, what does that access actually look like? And then the rubber meets the road, ladies and gentlemen, with that third column. How do we strike the right balance between those critical ingredients? Let's go to the next slide. Here on this slide, as well as the next slide, so let's stay on this one for a minute, please. We see that in those two vertical columns, we see in dark gray, the majority of services, products and services that were of interest to CC members. And just for those of you who are having a problem reading the screen, we see at the very top, 100% of members of the CC wanted access to addresses, contact lists, and documents. And then that goes all the way down to 6% that were looking for services related to cryptocurrency exchange between members of the postal network. And then there's all sorts of shades in between. Now that's the CC. But if we look at the wider postal sector, we see that items that are further down the list of interest to the CC tend to be of more interest to members from the wider postal sector. So let's flip to the next slide. Taking the information that's presented in the previous slide and putting them into three horizontal bars, we see that top line, that with high demand line. We see the items that are of most interest to members of the consultative committee as well as those in the wider postal sector that are not perhaps members of the CC or maybe they're members of the CC. And we also see that within the CC, there's associations and the association position might not capture particular, uh, particular views of individual members. So, okay, that's fine. And then we look to the middle line and we see the medium demand and then low demand on the bottom. Now, I'd like you just to pay attention a little bit to what some of those specific products and services are in the top line, and we can return to them when we have our discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Nermin. She can walk us through four more slides. And then as they say, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Let's, let's get going on some more robust discussion. Nermin, please. Uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, and for the sake of time, uh, we need all of us to be brief, but I cannot prevent myself from saying, uh, saying to say thank you to uh, Peter and Luis for uh, the very hard task as they have, and also the International Bureau support. Uh, they are really, truly our heroes. Uh, following up with uh, Raj's slide on demand, 
You can see here uh, again CC and gray and uh, wider postal uh, sector players on blue. You can see there is an agreement about improved interconnectivity and better customer experience. Uh, also, ability to shape uh, the global postal uh, policy agenda. Yet, we find no interest from the CC on access to technical assistance, no interest from the CC on ability to shape uh, regulatory and policy decisions, while we can see there is interest on this side from wider postal players. So, uh, from demand, uh, again, uh, this, uh, this analysis can uh, lead us, uh, next slide please, to uh, many questions, should products and services be packaged in accordance with demand and expected benefits? So there have been talk about prioritization of the provisional list, uh, what to start with, not so. We This might can be a, a start point for this. And what combination of products and services can better promote and achieve interconnection and interoperability between GOs and wider postal sector players? And please do not look at this analysis and these questions away from what Keith and Catherine has provided this morning from practical examples on uh, models and business models can be explored uh, between the GOs and wider postal sectors. Next slide, please. And we move to the third one, which terms and conditions. Under which terms and conditions UPU product and service could be made accessible to wider postal sector players? As we have heard this morning, uh, Keith told us they are not interested in remuneration, but market rates. So these are the points of terms and conditions and we explore together about opening them. So it's just not be opened as they are opened among GOs. There might be amendments to, to the model itself. Next, please. And this leads us to win-win situation, which is mentioned by our dear uh, friend uh, Vincenzo, and also uh, William just didn't, didn't mention it clearly, but he said about setting the balance between uh, the, the private operators and uh, the CTOs. These are the main points that we have it. And uh, while doing the win-win situation, protecting universal service obligations, uh, defining level playing field uh, principle and uh, reciprocity of interconnection. These are the main topics and uh, Raj, now uh, we can open the floor for discussions, for questions. And if you want to get back to the first morning session and to address questions to Keith and Catherine, Vincenzo and William, please, uh, the floor is open. Nermin, I have, uh, we have one, uh, one gentleman who wanted to take the floor this morning. We had a lady that wanted to take the floor as well. Oh, me, yes. That was oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> and I also oh, yes, wanted, I but I wanted to lead off, if yes. you don't mind. I want to lead off with the, with, with the panelists. No, no, but please, uh, let's give the floor. The panelists, okay. the floor okay. first. And then we, can start, we can start with the floor then. Yes. So, Santosh, let me come back to you. But if we can go to the gentleman from Tanzania and then come to, uh, to uh, Santosh, uh, and then we'll, we'll go that way. And if you can please, just when you take the floor, since we don't have placards, if you can uh, just say your name and the organization you're representing or the country you're representing, that would be appreciated. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Harun Ilemanya, uh, manager of postal services from the postal regulator in Tanzania. Since morning, I've been uh, listening carefully and interesting on the presentations and the discussions. Mr. Moderator, much as we would like to see that UPU accommodate wider postal sector players, there are key issues, according to my experience, to be considered, especially in developing countries like mine and African continent. We are in different stages of regulatory reform not complete in some countries. While the reform agenda has been there for quite a long time, in some countries, we have seen very difficult to allow competition into traditional monopoly of the postal markets and retaining the universal service at the same time. Having said that, Mr. Chairman, we, we think that we need to find a way that we are going to plan our stages 
or in stages to ensure that everybody will jump into that boat without any um, uh, problem, with clear understanding of what they are doing, be it a, a stakeholder, a government, ministry, or regulator, or the operator, especially the uh, uh, DOs. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I like the question you posed when you started, Mr. Raj. What is that we are doing well that will attract other players? And that was a very important question all of us to consider. And I would like to pick only one quickly, uh, only one product uh, that is uh, postcode and addressing systems. In Tanzania, we have well-organized and functional national addressing system. And that has come because of bravery of our president, uh, High Excellence Samia Sulu Hassan, who pronounced it as a government priority project. After this wonderful support by the president, many companies realized the importance of addressing and postcode. And we're now receiving a lot of uh, inquiries, people and companies wanting to use the uh, postcode and addressing in their business. Now we have arguments among ourselves, whether we sell this address and postcode files to other stakeholders, or we give it for free. And if we are selling, under which terms and conditions. And I wanted to learn from the presenters, especially from uh, Canada, Italy, USA, Australia, in the high table. How do you handle this? Or how do you think we should handle this? Sharing the national addressing and postcode data files that have been created, or rather we have worked very hard investing uh, heavily on the system. And now the new players who may not have paid a penny uh, wanting to get it from us. I thank you. Thank you very much, Tanzania. Uh, now we can take these question by question. I think that if we're all brief, we can, we can move quite quickly and go question by question. Is that okay with, uh, with everybody? So we don't have a long list of questions. So to your question, I'll make a quick comment. When, we, when, when Walter talked earlier about academics being interested in, in the UPU and products and services, we see that there are various institutions dealing in specialization with geomatics and geodesy that can provide extremely granular services with regards to geolocation. We see that there's also, um, maybe there's companies out there that we can learn from, such as What Three Words, that's using a completely different methodology for addressing direction location services. We see integration with private companies and even items like, I just bought this. My kids told me to get it, it's an iWatch. And I've got positioning on, on this. I can literally show my location anywhere I am in the world, but where that matters to us is in dynamic redirection of our products when we go out for delivery. Um, we talk about postal code updates, routing and uh, route optimization. We talk about even parcel lockers and locations. So there's all sorts of different areas where we can cross pollinate um, you know, something as simple and seemingly benign as addressing postal and addressing solutions. But let me turn the floor over to anyone that wants to address either on the panel or even from the floor, knowing that we have subject matter experts. Tunisia, please, if you're speaking directly to the... Okay, perfect. It's regarding the same topic. Uh, honestly, uh, he put, uh, our dearest delegate put his finger on the, really the place which hurts. Why? Because we know as government that there are many companies private companies that are developing solutions uh, on addressing. And I know many countries who are really successful, you, you, successful, who had successful models using these companies' models for e-commerce, for example. So here, my intervention will be like in form of a question. To whom is this data, addressing data, is owned? Is it owned by governments or the designated operator or UPU? Uh, uh, I'm asking just to like to help people to brainstorm regarding this. Uh, does this raise any issue related to uh, privacy and data protection and so on? Uh, why, why private companies really need these solutions if they already develop their own and uh, normally it, it should be really successful solutions and I, I witnessed uh, many uh, successful solutions like, like this. I'll be brief and uh, let the others think about it. 
Yeah, Mona, you've touched on a very sensitive issue, right? Because this is part of basket three. It's part of some of those more controversial proposals. Does anyone else have a comment regarding Tanzania's question? And thank you, Tunisia. Okay, yep, yeah. yeah. okay. Okay, um, this was one of the, I, I re referred to addressing solutions in my discussion and it is one that came up among our members as of being of interest. And I, I the, from, from Tunisia, I totally agree that there are the privacy issues um, and there are you know, ways, each country has their own privacy issues, of course, too. And I think in the United States, we have tight controls over who can access the address database and you have to be certified and you have to pay a fee and all of those things. But but I think where the, where the value is, is that if there is a, a central repository where you know the data has been checked and is, you know, if it's provided by the country of origin, then you know, hopefully it's correct and, and in the right form. Um, but the point is to have the correct address so that the package reaches its destination, right? And you're not dealing with returns and you're not dealing with a bad customer experience. And um, if I could put my member on the spot, um, Michael Pakula, we have talked a little bit about this. Um, and if you would, would you mind sharing your experience just with the addressing and why it's important? Uh, thank you, Kate. Can you hear me? Okay. Michael Pakula is my name. I'm the CEO of Boxy, and we're a US technology company. Addressing is very important uh, from, uh, I, sorry, the point I want to make is the value of the data. I think that's the question. I'm less concerned in my world about the privacy, as in that needs to be resolved before it comes to us. But the question about does that data have value, yes it does, and how it reduces the, the, the value for the customer journey, and it, it involves everybody in this room, is that when a, um, a delivery is attempted and it's not being able to be made, <clears throat> excuse me, there are additional costs in the return. Uh, there is time and energy uh, expended from the consumer. And in our world, we develop everything from the consumer outwards. So we start with the consumer, say, what is the journey the consumer wants? And then that leads us back to the position of uh, data is important. It solves a lot of problems for sellers. And yes, they will pay for it. And I think that's part of the question. Is it the value of the data? Keith, yeah, go ahead. To answer your question, <clears throat> Mail Innovations, when I used to run it years ago, was CAS certified. So everything, that you, to get the USPS discounts, we had to have CAS certification, which was address verification for every address based on the United States Postal Service standards. And so as part of their standards, we paid a third party to certify our addresses. So yes, it's been done for a long time. I think it's a lot better. I don't know if CAS even exists anymore, frankly, since it's been a few years. That said, in your case, if you have a good database, if we're delivering through you, you use your database and charge us more to drop a package. That would be included in the price that you would negotiate with us. If we're only using you in certain parts of your country because you choose to do whatever or we have a separate, then if it's a value, we would pay for it. It's just, again, it's a fair market exchange once we gain in, you know, insights as to each other's needs. But if you have something of value that makes sense, that saves us money, that increases your value, that is of value. That is of worth and people will pay for it. And to, to the question from Tunisia, who owns it? Depends on who develops it. Number one, to points made, it has to follow European GDRP rules. It has to follow US uh, privacy rules. But once it's developed, if it's developed by uh, Tanzia, then it's theirs. Yeah, obviously, I'd assume you're following your rules, so it should be yours, and you should charge for it. I would hope you would. That's, that's the right thing to do. If it's developed by the, uh, by the UPU, well, use it then charge for it. If I don't, but they have to develop, they have to follow the rules, but the, the countries have their own databases. They have their, you know, the posts have their own databases. They have to follow their own privacy rules. I can't explain how they all do that. It's beyond me, but if it's a value and if it's protected and done right, I would expect it to be part of the process of what the posts would charge the free market. So knowing that that's a basket three item, it's a little more controversial, of course, you know, and it's something that there are a, a number of legal and regulatory and privacy challenges, et cetera. I get all that. But just since we're having a friendly conversation amongst 150 of our you know, closest friends, what's it worth to you? 
have no I'm idea. Just, I'm just kind of curious. Have you, have you, have, or even for, for IMAG then, um, for your members, have they, have you had that discussion on, you know, what's, no, it, what's it worth to you? I don't know what it's worth, but, and I'm looking at Peter Chandler, maybe he knows, I mean, the NCOA, the <laughs> National Change of Address, I think they had to pay $200,000 a year or something outrageous, right? Okay. Somebody from, remember this? Anybody? But anyway, it, it, it's expensive. So I think folks recognize, but if you're saving $15 on a return package, you know, maybe, maybe that's worth it. I don't know. I don't know the, what Listen, the price is, but let's have a market. Let's get a little market test together. Tanzania and, and asked the question, Kate, and, <laughs> and I got to thinking it's kind of like the old guy that lives down the street with a box full of Beatles records, you know, original prints. It's like he's sitting on a gold mine, but he doesn't know it. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, again, notwithstanding all of the, 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 <laughs> the serious legal issues that we'd have to deal with, I'm just curious if the thought process had even gone there. Well, I don't, I think this is what, we create a small little nimble working group and, and we figure out what people might want to pay for something as part of a test. I don't, I don't know, you know, it's not my area of expertise for sure. I've now probably... All right, there we go. Michael, help me out here. Okay, I can help you out there. From an API perspective, cents per uh, address. That's how it would have to be for a wider market uh, adoption. And, and from a UPS standpoint, I know there are market studies being commissioned as we speak to sit there and say, what is, what is a market charge for in, in, in each one of your jurisdictions? We already drop you know, packages off in all 192 countries, either through posts, which many of which we do, or we do it through uh, third parties. That's the market. That may include address, that may not, don't know, depends on the geo. But that's what, at the end of the day, the post compared to. I think you know what your market rates are uh, within your geo, certainly better than I would. And if that includes strong address verification, it would be included in that. If it would be better than that, and it would beat the competition, then it would be an upcharge. So, Again, those market rates are determined based on what it costs us right now to deliver a package. And I'd rather give, frankly, the post, the, the, the tie goes to the post, in my opinion, because they're already there doing it, so why not? But it's going to be competitive, and that's just the way the nature of the market is, and posts will have to compete like everybody else, as, as we do. But come on, Keith. I mean, that's, you're, you're so smart, because you know, you know I, I'm sure it's built into the market rates, and I'm sure it's already in there, so I don't, I don't think so. I don't know. No, I'm not that smart. <laughs> But it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, ex your, your, your suggestion is that it's intrinsic to no, rates. It depends on the market. It depends on what's going on. If I go into a market that has no such address verification and it's costing us money with our current vendor and they're not supplying and they're having returns and everything else and they have something that's built into it, I'll pay more for it. Okay. So I don't know if it's intrinsic. Okay. It depends on what the competition has and how valuable that asset is that they developed. Okay. See? Interesting, we have this discussion on addressing. Now, it's part of our more controversial set of recommendations, um, but does anyone else have any questions, any, any comments before I turn the floor over to Nermin to take the next round of questions? Or, I guess, issue? No, 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 we'll, we'll come to you, unless, it, it's, is it based directly on this? It's connected. Then in that case, Nermin, I'll turn the floor over to you, and you can, yeah, yeah, no, 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 but you can manage the discussion with Santosh. So Santosh, please, sure. go ahead, yeah, he's, He's kind of linking it. But you have something else. You're able, you're able to hear me, right? He's going to so, do a nice segue I, from one issue to the next. Yeah, exactly. Because that my point covers, uh, comes, covers that part and as well as the level playing field, I'll address both. So I think based on what I have seen for the last few years working with UPU and several post offices, the way they're looking at addresses is still location. And that would get into challenges because people move and there are multiple people living in the same location. So as far as I remember, the last time I saw the addressing system recommendations, there was a digital address to be created on top of a physical address so that people or identities can be the key focus. In that case, identity and address verification happens in one single transaction. So that will eliminate a lot of risk. There's a difference between point of origin, person of origin and point of interest. Both are called POI. But how do you map it together so that even if there are five people living in one house, they all will have a separate address but same location? So I saw that note, and of course, that's what we do as a business. So by the way, my name is Santosh Gopal. I represent a conservative committee member. I have my own company called Ship to My ID. I'm also playing a dual role of um, vice chair with Walter's help. So before somebody proceeds too far, 
in the journey of addressing as an infrastructure, think about connecting identity along with the address. That's just one thought. Now, when it happens, the way we approach is all the systems and databases should be owned by the local country's post offices because they are the address creator. They have, a, they have the U, US or, uh, uh, agreements where they're supposed to obligated to deliver to every location. Validation of address and identity both should be, in our view, should be post offices and everybody can subscribe per transaction, per membership, or depending on whatever countries, how their rules are. But uh, now how this connects to the second part, you did mention level playing field, which is important, but what happens if there are some IP rights involved in certain countries? So it does become, I'm not expecting a solution now because it's not easy, but we should also think about how do you do define and protect IP rights? The idea is to create a good solution, doesn't matter who owns it, who created it, but IP rights should be also part of it and that could be conflict of interest with level playing field. That's Does anyone else have any? Thank you, Santosh. Um, you also wanted the floor, I think. Or it was, do you want to? Okay. Good. Okay, thank you, Raj. Uh, so now let's move for a contribution part. We, want, we have two very dear colleagues, uh, Peter and Louise, and we need to support them in their future work. So can we go to the brief slide, please, Mr. Han? We have a question and we need to answer uh, the, the previous one about uh, products and back, uh, this question, uh, slide uh, 69. Yes. So I will address the question to the floor and to our dear guests, panelists. Based on the analysis that you have seen, should products and services be packaged in accordance with demand and expected benefits? And what are your views about what is the most uh, required products to be opened? and the expected benefits from your point of view, and what combinations of products and service can better promote and achieve interconnection and interoperability. This morning we have heard from Catherine about the pilot, and we have heard from uh, Keith about injecting volume to uh, the Boston network. And also from the perspective of William and Vincenzo, we need to listen from you what are the the first product and service we should open and how be packaged. So the questions for, for the panelists and allow me to start first with uh, Catherine, if you're ready. Okay. Well, we had just floated, it. it's actually something of a direct injection service too, but it's a commercial version. And um, the thought was to maybe provide a commercial solution to the post with direct injection into last mile delivery, which again could be used, be a postal operator that provides that, but perhaps um, coming in to LA and the, um, the, the post would like same day delivery, maybe you use FedEx or UPS or DHL. Um, and the idea being that you have a platform that's sort of at the heart of it that takes the manifest from the post and provides the transport and provides the, uh, finds the best transport and gives express-like service and does all of the bells and whistles pieces of it. But also, do we want to lay over there some UPU services if they are better, which maybe are some of the things we just talked about, which are addressing or, um, or the uh, track and trace opportunities or the supply chain services. Perhaps Oscar, if you wanted to calculate um, what your contribution to you know, your carbon footprint is, and again, with, to just reflect on Oscar for a moment, as, uh, as scope two and scope three emissions, you need to start thinking about what your supply chain partners are contributing to the whole process. So there's a real opportunity there as well. Um, again, I wouldn't mind turning it over to a couple of my members if they had any ways to talk about this and enhance it. I got Michael and I see Ignacio, and I don't know if anybody else out there would like to, um, to just share a little bit of thinking around that. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone, for your time this afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Michael Pakul, the CEO of Boxy. Uh, those that know me know that I can talk, although I'm sitting amongst all my friends this afternoon. Um, 
but I have prepared something just to keep it on track and respectful of everyone's time. Just quickly, we're an e-commerce logistics management platform where through one API, we provide the technology and services required by any entity involved in shipping e-commerce parcels with a major advantage in cross-border shipping. The UPU is a tremendous organisation with tremendous opportunity. In their home markets, each designated operator has strong brand recognition, a marketer's dream that can and should be leveraged for growth. When we consider the competitive landscape, the potential opportunity for growth lies in developing commercial cross-border e-commerce demanded shipping services. Not only are these services in demand from consumers and shippers, but these lanes offer great opportunity for designated operators to take new products to market, competing with com commercial services, generating new revenues and, of course, additional gross margin. So we have an alternative thought to the designated operator route and the UPU, but the concept is designated operators, here is an alternative, create new channels, uh, new shipping lanes, uh, new opportunity, new revenues. To date, Boxy has several designated operators developing these commercial lanes by leveraging our platform. To this end, Boxy <coughs> would be pleased to work directly with the UPU and designated operators to run a test requiring one designated operator who has one customer and report the findings back to the UPU as required. We can facilitate this trial quickly, in fact, within a few weeks, and we are happy to engage and commit our internal resources free of charge in order to remove that hurdle from conducting a trial and in order to review the results as soon as possible. Uh, in regards to a testing designated operator, we can work with any DO that is interested to be part of a trial or indeed to deep dive and develop these lanes right now. Um, I guess my broad message is as a platform, the message is in terms of opening up, Boxy is a, a giver, not a taker to the community. Thank you, Michael, uh, for this announcement. Um, if I may, Peter, you have the floor. Yeah, th thank you, I mean, um, th thank you for, for, for this answer. And as I'm, I'm co-chairing an expert team, um, to be honest with you, this sounds a little bit too vague for us. Um, we all know that we can grow our markets by working together and so on. If I ask you today, when you think about the end-to-end -end process of a parcel or an e-commerce e e package, sorry, where for you today are the hurdles and the problems? Why you need the UPU to, de to develop such a thing? I mean, with, with the direct in, in, injection model or direct injection platform, lots of operators have this. Um, you're not the only one. There's even um, postal operators who have such platforms when they're trying to optimize themselves. Um, so to, to say it again, where are the problems in today's environment? And why would you need the UPU? <laughs> Why do we need the UPU? Is that part of the question? Yes, but more importantly, where the problems are in the end-to-end -end process. Because if I gave you my number afterwards, we could easily set up a, 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 a trial in, in the next couple of weeks. But we could do such a trial even without the UPU, because a direct injection is not necessarily what I would consider with um, UPU. Correct, good point, you could do it yourself. So where we sit is we're a platform and through our one API, we give access to consumers globally and over 100 integrations with customs, uh, compliance, insurance and last mile carriers. So everybody can do everything themselves. Do they have the ability to do that? That's a whole different story. So rather than me, I didn't come here to sell, believe it or not. But the point is, is that speaking for itself, is that we have two DOs that are working with us. I know one, at least one is in the room. So we're under NDA, so I can't talk about that. But if they wanted to stand up and talk about that, they could. But the relevance is, it's obviously interesting to them for whatever reason, and I think there are hurdles within their own businesses. But I think what they're doing is creating express services that will create new revenues for them in markets that, where the postal solution isn't perceived to be good or isn't perceived to be demanded, that's something that everybody in the room needs to ask themselves about their services. 
Okay. I, I would like to make a comment here. That's why we need an enhanced CC so that, Michael, you can be part of it and uh, you offer a detailed proposal and to understand what are the benefits you can offer and uh, how it works. So that's why uh, we, all of us are convinced that enhanced CC is, is required. Uh, so that the wider postal players can contribute and, and develop the business models and offer it uh, to the DOs and PUC and, and see how, how we can proceed. So um, if I may uh, uh, to go to Vincenzo to hear your response on this question, please. Uh, should the product and service be packaged in accordance with demand and uh, expected benefits? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> it's about 10 years. We have a list of product services to open. Why don't we open these services? Again, we have a resolution uh, C9 from uh, Doha. We have a resolution C10 from Istanbul. And uh, also before, uh, I think just before the pandemic, in, in one of the last uh, uh, committee of C1, we also had uh, the approval uh, to, to engage uh, uh, the main stakeholder of the supply chain, uh, which are obviously our uh, first uh, uh, collaborator, like IATA, uh, WCO, and so on. So we have already this product and services. They're already listed. Who, who is, I have to do that. Are you asking me? To, to care about opening this, do you want to attract uh, stakeholders for this product? What is the question? No, no, the question is that we have currently now a provisional list with several packets. So mm -hmm. there is a question say that it should be packaged in demand and expected benefit. For example, when we talk today, okay. um, the key said we don't need your remuneration system. So, okay. Uh, Catherine said that we can go to the supply chain for this is supply chain. So it's it's like packaging uh, this you know like like basket one and three. This is uh, provided <coughs> based on the resolution from Istanbul and uh, the the the, 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 the um, what you call it, the progress of the work since Istanbul till now. But till this moment, we don't have a clear idea on, on what to be opened now based on good. Uh, benefits because we have not yet made uh, the analysis as, as Peter said. So if you have an idea on this, and if you don't, it's fine. Uh, so we can go to William. If no, no, I have. mean, you know, it, it's just that uh, we, we, we have already the list that at least at UPO level was released at the products which uh, uh, were interesting for uh, stakeholders. And in some cases, some stakeholders already participate in these services. So it's maybe there is a need to enlarge uh, the uh, stakeholder using these services. And this is what I said this morning when I was looking to uh, the consulting committee. So why along this time, even some products were promoted to be open, nothing really concrete happened, you know? Because these are not the products that the stakeholder wants. I'm talking about uh, main services uh, provided by the IB, like legal services, uh, uh, also participation in training program, capacity building, uh, access to dot post, uh, and so on. I mean, you know, let's be clear on that. Why we are not developing this product? We are, why we are not gathering interest on this product, concretely, I mean? We have few members which have uh, uh, already uh, been engaged, but uh, let, let's see what uh, uh, Shiva, with your permission, uh, can add to that. Thank you, Vincenzo. Um, just to give some context uh, for everyone here as to what Basket One is about. So, um, as Raj pointed out, uh, these are products and services that member states had agreed uh, should be made accessible to uh, wider postal sector players. And each of these products and services have, um, uh, to a large extent, a number of terms and conditions that have been approved by member states uh, by way of access, uh, and, uh, and there's been a process. Um, the focus 
of the technical review of basket one is, is really about asking the question, as Vincenzo points out, we have provided for sort of legal access, um, but there hasn't been real uptake. Now, that could be um, because of the fact that the product itself isn't meeting the needs of our stakeholders. That's one. The other alternative explanation could be we don't sell these things out to the marketplace and no one really knows about them. But it's the sort of thing that we actually need to get into. Uh, and, and, and we need our stakeholders to tell us, guys, you've got this right, you've got this wrong. Um, and, and, and it's a point that uh, Raj also made at the start, which is, you know, we want to hear what's, what we're doing well and what we're not doing good and, and how do we improve it. And, and so that's really the focus of you know, basket one. Um, the, the, the packaging issue is, is, is sort of, it, it touches basket one to some extent, but it's really more about basket two and basket three. Thank you. Thank you, Siva, for clarification. But it's exactly what I said when I said that we have a provisional list in you, other than Istanbul uh, packet or basket. So for the new list of services, but uh, uh, you, uh, Vincenzo, you have closed here. Uh, no, 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 I just wanted to, uh, because to, we need to comment. Uh, we have no, 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 just because, uh, I mean, you, you are correct. I mean, probably the, the answer is, is for, for both, you know. Some, uh, you know, are not interested, they know. Others maybe don't know the, 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 um, the system, uh, the, sorry, the services. Uh, maybe it's also our fault that we uh, were not uh, uh, really, uh, I mean, well promoted. One, one of the examples is dot post, you know. We, uh, we, we never along this time made it concrete, the use of dot post, or, and in some, somehow not attractive not even for the, the members. This is the, 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 so see, we maybe should also work in, in a way of uh, better also uh, enhance that. And, and that is uh, probably, this uncertainty is also be read on the fact that when you see the ranking list of services, it's not, it's quite, you know, balanced. It's like say, okay, you know, there is some doubt for the stakeholders, I think. Thank you, Vincenzo. Uh, Egypt uh, had some would like to take the floor, but first uh, go to <laughs> Walter, because he asked before you, and then uh, get back to you. Mr. Walter, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, a, very, uh, a very direct answer. Uh, why did nobody pick up Oscar, train post, supply chain management solutions on the scale we actually expect it. Well, um, when we started our marketing uh, for the CC, um, we made that knowledge available through the wider postal sector players. And I was amazed. Um, most of those guys had no idea that these, these products are actually open. Um, um, uh, yeah, and, um, and then the next stage was, um, so, so how can we engage? Yeah, and, and that helped us to promote the consultative committee. And, and those guys were, were actually quite substantial postal, postal um, related entities. Yeah, so world class leaders in producing, I don't know, uh, postal systems. Yeah, and, and again, opening up is one thing, um, but they also need additional qualifications for that. Now, to give an example, there was, um, um, we were talking to two or three airlines. They're all interested um, in, in the supply chain management products, but what they need for the governments is a stamp of approval that they are compliant and certified according to UPU rules. Do we have that? Well, we, we, we took the, the initial steps to do that. It's not done. Yeah, so, so the products are actually fantastic we can offer. We didn't promote them, and they stopped before they were actually ready for market approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walter. Um, Hatim, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you, Namin. I think we are in a little confusing situation.
the consultative committee as well as other stakeholders do not have a clearly distributed workload. For example, some deal with the dressing, others deal with other dimensions and parts. Some take responsibility for the organizational aspects. I don't think the situation is so clear. It's a bit confusing to determine where the interests lie. We have many members in the consultative committee, but we don't have a full view of the background of that composition of the count of the committee, it, whether these uh, companies working on IT solutions, for example. And so I think we do need to know who is doing what, who is responsible for what. We need to know what the services that we can offer are. Thank you, Hatem. I believe if stewards can respond to this about uh, the, the split of the CC uh, response, as it has been made on the Ministry and Regulator and DOs, if this can be provided uh, later on uh, on the survey analysis, if it's possible. To give yeah. us the clarity about the responses. No, definitely. We can look at that. And we already have, I think, some detailed things um, attached to our report. But if it's not there, then we can add it and provide that later. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. So I remind uh, myself and you about the timing. And uh, I give the floor to William and then Keith uh, to respond to the question. Again, should products and service be packaged in accordance with demand and expected benefits? William, you have the floor. Thanks, Dermine. And, and look, my remarks, I'll, I'll pick up on what Walter was saying and what we've been talking about in terms of what products and services are valuable and why we might not have seen particular products and services taking off. I think it's important to remember that our products and services suite are designed to fulfill a specific function. And that specific function is to connect to designated operators. And I, I think it's not surprising that if we op are look, saying, op let's open up a product and service, a particular product and service, that our wider sector are going, well, we, we're not a designated operator. We don't fit within that box. Why is that product useful for us? Um, and I think a really good example of that, if we want to make our products and services more valuable, is we need to think at that more strategic level about what those products and services are doing. So when we talk about should we package them up, I think the answer is yes. I think we should package them up into different types of products that do different types of things. I think that makes it more uh, accessible, easier to understand. Um, but at the same time, we need to understand why our products and services work the way they are and then question whether those products and services are fit for purpose. And I can see people nodding off, so I'll use the word IMPC code, which will, I'm sure, wake everyone up, right up, um, <laughs> in, including the people back in Australia are listening in. But I, I want to just pick up on that because IMP, IMPC codes are very sensitive and I don't, I don't want to get into that debate. But I. I put it out there that IMPC, why we have IMPC codes is because member countries have agreed to, to a, a particular way of, member, of designated operators exchanging things with each other. And we have agreed that for a particular remuneration and a particular price. And we have, following my diagram, if, if we have agreed to that particular price, why have we agreed to that particular price? And the answer is to support social development. So it, in order to understand whether IMPC codes are valuable for the wider sector, we as governments need to understand how can we support that social development? Do we need to unpack that from our remuneration structure? Do we need to unpack our remuneration structure from our IMPC code? And then we can have a conversation with the wider sector around that code without the baggage of all the other components. And I think that's the same for a number of the products and services that are on this slide, that they, that they are themselves interlinked. And in order to sell, in order to engage with the wider sector on particular products, we need to understand how we can unpick those products 
from our system and what our plan is for that system going forward to be able to show what that value is for wider sector players going in. Thanks, Mimi. Uh, thanks, William, for this clear answer. Very, very insightful, very helpful indeed. Uh, I can see Franz ask for the floor and then Siva. Franz, you have the floor. Elizabeth? Merci. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm going to change topic a little. Since this morning, we haven't heard much about a very important activity, recognizing the role of posts in terms of financial inclusion. This is a topic that was touched upon last week in particular during the POC meetings. Many observations were made. First of all, we found that the role of posts has been recognized to ensure financial inclusion, that furthermore, postal financial services represent some 20% of postal revenues. However, financial transactions and postal financial services represented only 1% of global financial transactions and that figure is falling. So that was a real problem identified. Furthermore, a study has been carried out by, by Ernst & Young Consultancy who have studied this and have put forward 12 recommendations working on the basis of several different scenarios. In the results of that study, it was clear that the status quo is not viable. Yet the recommendations that were most beneficial for the future looked at work with through partnerships to ensure financial services which are adapted to current needs and which can meet the need for financial inclusion. A task force was established to work on this topic, which should come back to the Extraordinary Congress with proposals. The situation has been recognized as urgent. And so I did want to want to flag up that problem. Everyone needs to mobilize. Of course, course around that specific task force, but also through work which will be undertaken in the expert team of the CA committees or other work under the CA as well. Thank you. Thank you much. Liz uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Very good point. You are absolutely right. Financial service is one of uh, the products that's seen by majority of member countries as a very good prospect for opening. And I believe because most of our panelists are has to do with logistics, not financial, but this can be considered next time and, and to bring from uh, the financial um, or the finance uh, sector. So, uh, Siva, you have raised the flag. I'm not sure if you want, uh, because we have China online with us. You have the floor. Um, thank you, uh, Namin. <clears throat> I just wanted to share um, an anecdote. Well, it's not an anecdote, but it actually happened. Um, so, a few weeks ago, Peter uh, was in Ultima's room, and we were talking about what are we going to do in terms of progressing the work of the expert team. And I think the three of us were pretty much in tears because we weren't quite sure how to progress things. And, and quite frankly, we've had a really good discussion, um, a good dialogue, but we're not still getting direction. We're not getting direction. And I'm, I'm, I'm putting this out as a challenge to you, the moderators, the panelists, and people in the audience. How do we fix this in a way that allows us to bring something that's useful to Congress? Because yeah. frankly, there's no point calling ministers from 192 member states to come together if we're just going to go back and say to them, we're doing more studies, right? Um, and, and, and our citizens are expecting us to deliver something as well. So I really like all the discussions, but I'm sure Peter, myself, and Altamir are going to be crying after this uh, as well. Actually, 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 Siva, this is what I'm trying to do here. I, I noted down what uh, Catherine said, but she's kindly did it. She said, addressing track and trace and Oscar. So I'm trying to provide the list here. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to make a point on my notebook. I actually have a line here where I was actually whispering to Nermin, hey, can you give me the floor after Keith and uh, who else? Is we will, after China and Keith. 
Yeah, yeah. after China and yeah, Kiev. You may comment to but receive, but please do. My, but my comment was exactly along those lines, which is, uh, I'm lost, and this has been a great dialogue, but what's the outcome? And I was going to ask Peter to say, have you heard anything that actually drives the agenda forward? So, Nermina, I'll give it back to you. Okay. Thank we're, you. we're going till six, right? I believe our uh, colleague from uh, yeah. Saudi Arabia, you, you on the floor. If you, yes, please let me give China first and get back to you, okay? No, I'm afraid I'm going to make it even more diverse, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at this for, okay. for now. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I'm track, I'm trying. I'm writing them down. <laughs> Shaina, uh, online, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nermin, for giving me the floor. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to uh, share our concerns and uh, views. Uh, first, we think that nobody will deny the principle that any policy for the opening up of the postal products and services must be discussed on the premise of not affecting the normal, healthy, and sustainable development of postal channel business within the business scope of designated operators. And the objective of the action should be a win-win scenario and a stronger global postal network. As all we understand, Remuneration system is not only a set of rates, but the overall postal channel business system corresponding to all kinds of postal products, including letter post, parcel post, and EMS. And MPC is not just a set of codes, but the overall operational basis for postal items exchanged by all designated operators in the global postal network. They are derived from the experience and achievements accumulated over the years by all designated operators of UPU members since the establishment of UPU in 1874. This can also be fully demonstrated that remuneration system and MPC are completely different and irrelevant with the commercial channel business and the operational model of the wider sector player currently conduct. Therefore, the opening up of these two core areas of UPU will obviously shake the foundations of the global postal network. And from another perspective, means that the wider sector players can enjoy the same terms as the existing designated operators can enjoy and enjoy the full and complete access to the market by extending from the current commercial channel business to all postal channel services. In view of this, in order to maintain the stability and the business order of the global postal network, we think that we should avoid the chaos and disorder of postal services caused by excessive and improper opening up of the postal products and services. In this regard, we believe that both the remuneration system and MPC codes, which are the cores of the UPU and the global postal network, should not be included in the list of the UPU products and the services to be opened up to wider sector players. In addition, to ensure the potential opening up of other postal products and the services fulfill the above mentioned principle, an in-depth market and impact analysis should be carried out to assess the specific influence of the opening up process for both the designated operators and the wider sector players. Second, what we have been trying to find out and what is very important is the opening up of UPO products and services should be on the reciprocal basis. So we are wondering what tangible valuable contributions and the unique resources the wider sector players can and prepare to bring to UPU and to the designated operators. As we can see, the 
the results of the questionnaire shows that the benefits of the opening up to wider sector players are still very general and limited. It just basically and mainly mentions that it can increase postal volumes through UPU. As we all know, the market is changing and the customer demand is adjusting constantly. And the increase of business volume, especially the increase of postal business volume, is composed of many factors. On the one hand, the opening up of so many key UPU products and services to the wider sector players is not necessarily associated with an increase in postal business volumes. And the expected benefits is mainly the growth if the expected benefits is mainly the growth of postal channel business volume, then the sensible and feasible way is that the wider sector players can cooperate as the customer of the designated postal operators. On the other hand, we all know that every coin has two sides. The results of the questionnaire and the technical review did not mention the possible negative impact and the potential new problems that the opening up of the core UPU products and the services, for example, the remuneration system and MPC, might bring to the market and the existing business, which we think should not be ignored and should be analyzed and considered. Thank you, Narmi, for giving me the floor. Thank you all. Thank you, Helen, for uh, sharing with us your views uh, on this important topic in a clear way. And now allow me to reach to Keith. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, first to answer, to respond to questions, and please help uh, uh, our colleagues, uh, Luis and uh, Peter and uh, Altamir and uh, Siva, if you have any list for products to be opened and if you, whatever you want to say. <laughs> I, I could go on for days. Uh, First of all, I just want to give you a package and pay for you to deliver it. You can call it an IMPC code if you want to. You can call it a label that has a UPU emblem on it. Or you can call it a label that has a foreign postal emblem and a UPS label on it. I don't really care. I just want to say, do you want a package? And I'll pay you market rate to deliver it. Now, there's a lot of things. To Steve's point, how do you get into this thing? And the challenge is, and it is a challenge, uh, well, as, as, we, as we launched the SurePost program, I put a pretty simple label up there, but we were on the phone for dozens of hours with IT, figuring out all those codes and everything else. It is such a pain, and I am not good at it. I can tell you that right now. But that has to happen. And so preparation has to happen. And then if UPS wants to deliver a package, we already delivered to 220 countries and territories right now. So we already have someone right next to you or some of the people in this room we're paying right now to deliver a package, that is happening. So for me to say, let's do a test, which we need to do, by the way, let's, we have to integrate, well, I have already someone there. Do I need to get someone new? I don't know, because we, UPS has brown country, where we have infrastructure we have paid for, we have infrastructure where we have companies that have our logos, and we have, in most countries, couriers that deliver it, that compete against the posts. Those couriers will turn over. So when they start to turn over, do you want to be on the list to take that volume? That's how something like this is probably going to evolve. You have to do the IT, you have to do the processes, and you have to whiteboard it. And that's, I find, if there's anything I can say, Steve, that has to be done right now is clarify the information, misinformation, good information, don't know. But as soon as you whiteboard it, then a million more questions come up. For instance, if I want to go from country A to country B and they want me to do it, does it make sense to use their transportation? Because it can't build the ULD right now, so we can use existing transportation infrastructure. Maybe, maybe not. Customs, I'm not worried about that. I don't think any customs authority is going to let us circumvent the law uh, by calling our package a postal package. If that happens, then I, I, I would be surprised if that happens. And so that has to be those, that's for me the next step that has to happen everywhere because a lot of those other products and services then start to clamp onto that whiteboard. The process of integration, the services that are ancillary that come on, the programs for address cleansing and address hygiene, all those start to come on within those pricing networks. The whiteboard is key and then the test is the key. And I know I heard some concerns about what if it goes wrong, things could be long term, then you stop. You see, I don't want any more UPS packages. I don't want to get paid market rates anymore, and I'd rather sit there and have you pay my competitor. Okay, decision made, done. 
Now, I will pose a question to this group, and I'm gonna be a little, little bit tougher on this one, because I'm, I'm getting a dagger out of myself. It's been said several times, and people are concerned, cherry picking, cherry picking. People don't wanna say it, I'm saying it. Are we gonna cherry pick you? We are chasing high yield products like everybody else is, like everybody in this room is, like biggest, big, biggest integrators in this world are. That, we're doing that. And I'd like to think we're doing it okay, but at the same time, we have our, our frailties as well. But the trends right now, last time the UPU had meetings in, in May, I heard for three hours how integrators and express companies were taking volume from the people in this room. So I did some basic research, it's on the internet. UPS grew 10% in 2019 and 7.9% in 2020. There you go. Look it up on our financial statements. International volume, cross-border. Not bad, not bad. FedEx, a little bit different, but nothing better than that. IPC, it grew 100% in 2019. It grew almost 100% in 2020. Now, who belongs to IPC? I'm just calling it like it is in this room now. I've, uh, there's a term I loved earlier, Raj. Industry capture. Dominant players taking control of others in the room to obtain their agenda. Everybody has it, and I'd venture to guess that some people in this room have the same thought. Some of those people may be IPC members. The presentation given yesterday on the flows of postal goods was a terrific presentation, but I don't think it captured the flows of some of those largest companies that have subsidiaries that right now are sending volume through the, through the through ETOs, through their own organizations. That needs to be understood, so this organization understands what's happening. You challenge me for those numbers or public information, I'll share them with you, I'll send you the email that pulls off our financial statements and says we got this much volume into it. Not the amount of volume that this room has lost. And so you need to look into that, that is serious. So that's one thing on the, on the cherry picking. On the other th thing though, I wanted to answer because yeah, UPS, we are gonna go after the best volume as so many other competitors are. At the same time, two days ago we had our earnings release. And our CEO got up there and said, we now have technology available to where we are able to take an item as soon as it gets put into a cart and as soon as it's sold from one merchant, but it will be a few more later on in multiple longer term platforms and pair it downstream immediately. And as soon as that pairing's made, adjust the pricing because now you have a multi-piece delivery going to one residence. Real time price dynamic pricing. We already deployed that right now. We also have RFID labels in 100 of our facilities to where as soon as our label gets put on, we don't have to scan it anymore. We know that package is every minute of the transportation on the way. That allows us to adjust our flows, everything else. This stuff is coming. That's a cherry pick. This room won't even see those packages unless we can work together because it's gonna get picked out by IT systems way in advance. And right now, it frustrates me because I see so many talented men and women in this room, but we're so busy trying to fight against ED, you know, the, the, the customs and security rules and all that stuff that we've been doing since the 80s, you need to go forward in progress. You need to get new technology. You need to get what some of the Gates members have. That's what's gonna sit there and propel this room forward. Or you're gonna be cherry picked to death. It'll be some from within this room and you know who I'm talking about and some without. So again, I think it's a great opportunity. I think this room has a lot to do, but whiteboarding is a first step. I'm sorry, I took too long. All, all, all good, Keith. Listen, yes, this is... All, Keith, thank you so much. And uh, Raj, please, you take it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nermin. And thank you, Keith. Listen, no, it, you're, here to, you're here to share your views. Your name has been used uh, in ill vein, I'm, I'm sure, uh, more than a couple of times. No, just, just kidding. But we wanted to hear from you. We wanted to hear from Keith. We wanted to hear from others. Uh, we have a time management issue as well, because technically this session is done in 60 seconds. But I think we're going to have to go just a couple of more minutes because we have the direct Deputy Director General here and we have the United States that's seeking the floor. And uh, I'd like to make a, a quick comment as well. We have 10 minutes. Translators, are we okay with 10 minutes? No problem. We have till 6.30. Yeah, but you have 10 minutes because we need to give... We have 10 minutes and then we go to the Deputy Director General. Okay. But we'll put you at the end because, you know... <laughs> Okay, unless you want to arm wrestle me for it. <laughs> so, uh, just to the point that, that the IB had made, and this is where, again, this is the difficult part of, of being on the rostrum, right? We have an extraordinary Congress, and we had several hours dedicated to trying to understand where and how we are going to proceed, even if we had modest goals, 
Basket one, and those first three. Let's just take it as an example. Those first three. Dot post, train post, and Oscar. Let's just talk about those. Peter and Luis, as the expert team chairs who've been running that process, building that 109-page document, and stewarding the process of looking at the 22 products and services, did you get anything crunchy or granular that you can take back outside of a good dialogue, a good general dialogue? Do you have now a crystal clear sense on how we are to proceed? Yeah, I can see it from your face. You only have to take it. Please, Peter. Honestly, no, but I'm still grateful for the inputs yeah. I got because what the both of you said changed my perspective. Both of you said something regarding a direct injection platform. And, and I'm also grateful for the word whiteboarding. What we're doing here is we start from a fixed range of products and services and try to market every single one on an individual basis. I think what we should do is also whiteboard ideas, product ideas, and then kind of pick and pack these products and services into this new product which you envisaged before. What I would have hoped for was, based on this example with the direct injection platform, what kind of products and services of those up there would you already see into this specific product which you propose? And I suspect part of the complexity here, Peter, I mean, recognizing that Austria just ranked at the very top of the global list for you know, savvy and technical postal operators performing at a very high level. But the, the, you know, the other member countries that are here and they're listening to the dialogue and trying to figure out, how do I impute intelligently into this discussion? Where's the opportunities for our partners? I don't think they're there yet. And then, so we have, now we have a communication gap between the most sophisticated operators and, and member countries and those who are struggling with development issues, as we've heard a number of developing countries here air their views and concerns. So we have a, ladies and gentlemen, we have a communication issue. Right, so I, I feel good about the dialogue that we've had, but I'm not fully satisfied. I'm still hungry and we've, we're running out of time. So having said that, uh, let me please give the floor to the United States. David. Well, let me say, first of all, I'm not speaking on behalf of the United States. This on is behalf of Davos. David Brown, there we go. Uh, this is a Davos type uh, format. Um, I took note of the fact that China has seen, if I understood correctly, was steadfastly against the idea of IMPC codes. I, frankly, I'm a little bit surprised because, you know, what we're observing in the international market is very important Chinese players like Alibaba and their Sainyao subsidiary building warehouses all around the world, including in Belgium, and, and using container shipments and then direct injecting. Uh, I mean, I think, I think there are opportunities for collaboration uh, between Chinese companies and, and direct um, designated operators. That would be the first comment I would make. Second, I think there's a little bit of understanding about an IMPC code. Just because an IMPC code is issued, it doesn't mean that a, that a member country has to recognize it. There is no obligation for uh, UPU countries to accept IMPC codes just because they're issued. I think that's a very important point. Um, I, th I think that the, the notion of doing a whiteboard exercise, uh, a market test in, in French, projet pilote, pilot project, whatever you want to call it, I mean, frankly, I don't want to see Siva, Altamir, and the Austrian gentleman crying. I mean, I, I think that we, we need to come up with, uh, you know, some practical ideas. We've heard a lot about market impact analysis. We cannot do a theoretical study about IMPC codes. We need a market test. It's only with a market test, where, let's say with a limited number of countries, a limited number of designated operators and interested non-designated operators, time limited, with a promise that the participants would share data with all you, with, with the secretary, with the IB, with all the member countries, and then however long the, the time limited test, is, two years or five years, that it be shared, and that the results of that, the successes, the failures, the mitigated successes, et cetera, can be analyzed with actual data. Uh, I think it's important that, you know, a country, I've been speaking with a number of countries from, from different continents, and and made the point, if you had a limited uh, test like this, there would be no obligation for other member states to join. It would be only, it would be purely voluntary. We've heard some discussion about, you know, remuneration. I mean, I think it was clear from the comments of, 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 of Keith and, 
and Kate and others that this would be determined by contract. It wouldn't be based on UPU remuneration rates. I mean, unless it so happened that the country involved or the designated operator wanted for some reason UP rates. I think that's unlikely. I think it would be uh, almost always determined by contractual agreements. Um, and we're talking about commercial clearance, not postal clearance. But again, under the caveat that in the, in the uh, market test, if a given country wanted to, the stuff to go through postal clearance, I suppose that would be possible. The point is, uh, this is something that's important. Um, we have to go step by step. But I think a, a whiteboard, first of all, a whiteboard analysis of what, you know, what would the parameters be for a market test, I think that could be done, certainly started between S2 and S3, maybe reported in S3, um, and then, uh, and then uh, a pilot project of, uh, I don't know how many years, that would be determined. Um, and that would be a step-by-step. -step. Most countries in the world probably not want to participate, but it would be a very useful exercise. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, let's go to our friends from Saudi Arabia. Please, sir, you have the floor. I will be brief, but I'm afraid I'll add to your dissatisfaction, Roger. <laughs> uh, uh, let me share from the discussions today uh, the, the, the experience we've had with our uh, operator. Perhaps that will shed some light. By no means this applies to many of the other countries. It would be relevant to some of the developing countries, I would believe, uh, uh, just to learn from. But our national you know, postal player has already lost. It's, it's not in the, he's not in the arena any, anymore. A few years ago, their market share went down to 6%. Irrelevant, really. And we've tried to protect it. We've issued decree after decree that you know, government agencies need to use them only, and so on and so forth. But even ministries did not use them all the time. They needed much faster, much more reliant uh, services, and they were willing to pay premium. And general public were willing to pay premium for a better service and so on and so forth. So that war in our country is lost a few years ago. And then we've decided if we can't protect them, or if we can't beat them, then join them. The, the approach we took with our national player is quite different. We have closed the government agency that is in charge of Postal. We have established a subsidiary company of it. So it's a private sector company now that runs our Postal. We got private sector people in the mix of running uh, that company. We've injected, instead, instead of inject, injecting subsidiaries to this company to, to survive, we've injected money for it to grow its capabilities. Um, just 15 minutes ago, it was announced that they have bought the largest uh, land uh, hall uh, company in, the, uh, in Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth. Uh, they have uh, introduced uh, digital products. Uh, they have created three other companies under them, and there are more to come. They need to be a global player in parcel and in other services as well for, in order for them to grow and to compete and to play the role that they played very beautifully during COVID, which is a national player that can go everywhere. We have the approach of protection did not work as much as the approach of giving them much better capabilities. Um, and then on a level playground, uh, they compete um, with others. There are so many details into that, but that's in general the approach we took. The final point I want to I I make, and I promised myself I will not make any points because I'm new to this whole postal thing and I'm still learning. And it's better to, be underst to understand first before you're understood. But I called the, the three top players in Saudi Arabia who are friends of mine, and I said, you know, there is a discussion at the UPU regarding la 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 I sit on the board of Saudi Air Cargo as well, so I called the CEO and asked him. And none of them seem to be bothered by, you know, whether they're in or out, or whether this even makes uh, any value um, t to them. Having said all of that, and I am outside the UPU world and the postal world, but into the logistics one, I have seen a lot of products today that would be of extreme value, but I don't think they know about them. So to, so to, to Walter point and, 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 and so on and so forth, there's a lot of, I think the marketing and the packaging needs a lot of work. And I think there's a lot of value um, in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And don't undercut yourself. That was uh, an excellent intervention and, and difficult to hear in, in, in parts of it. So let's go. Uh, I didn't see any other requests for the floor. So we have um, a request from the floor from Japan. Um, up on the balcony, and then uh, I've been told that at 10 after 6, um, we will then seek the views of our Deputy Director General, unless Vincenzo, oh, 
I'm sorry. Right. So we'll go to Japan. And then Vincenzo. Nirman's got you. Yeah. Okay, but you have to wait because Japan's going to go first. Let's go. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. So, so uh, Japan, please. Thank you. Naito san. <laughs> thank you, Raji san, uh, for finding me. <laughs> so, uh, I have to be uh, brief, uh, but uh, my view is that uh, it is essential uh, for us to duly consider the universal service obligation assigned to uh, designated operators. We believe that the universal postal networks and services would form an essential foundation for underpinning socio-economic development of member countries. Therefore, it is not our desire to jeopardize such an important obligation we have maintained for many years with a solid legal basis. In this regard, it is essential to maintain sound and fair competition environment between DOs and WPSPs when advancing the opening up. In doing so, we need a careful analysis on benefits and risks of the opening up uh, from the both economic and legal aspects. In particular, it is uh, important to have a cautious approach uh, when opening up some sensitive products and services that will delineate a kind of a raison d'etre or hope the global postal network services. I'm not sure uh, what kind of products and services uh, belong to that category, but according to the survey, it might be a remuneration system, IMPC code, and postal customs. At the same time, we can find early <coughs> harvest in some non-sensitive products and services. So according to the survey, it might be uh, some IT system and solutions, uh, research and analysis services, consultancy services, and uh, capacity building services. We really expect further analysis uh, by the IB, as well as member countries, for us to have well-informed and evidence-based decisions on this opening up issue in the coming extraordinary Congress. We can proceed with a step-by-step -step approach as agreed in the Abidjan Congress last year. Thank you. Wise words, as always, Neto san. Thank you very much. Um, we have a request from the floor from uh, our friend from Russia, Oleg. Please. Thank you, Chair. I will try to be brief. Today's discussion has provided a lot of new information, and I was particularly impressed by the example from the United States, in which USPS is really fulfilling the role that it has been allocated. And I agree with Vincenzo that clearly we must more, more actively motivate our services and particularly show our partners from uh, goods businesses to get the right idea And in fact, that we can learn something from them. We have obtained a whole list of uh, examples regarding cooperation with courier services in particular, but currently we don't have any assessment of the negative factors of opening the UPU, we have none. We can do this quite quickly, and I propose that we should do this immediately upon concluding this, se se this session. We need to form a perhaps some video conferences so that we can show the results to all of the member states of the UPU. And under such circumstances, I think that the methods of uh, of considering these mistakes that could be made are not correct. So we can only do pilot projects when we carry out some kind of theoretical study to see whether we have uh, created the right technical requirements for these pilot projects. So from my point of view, you, you're all very well aware of my view on this. We are in favour of opening it up to WPSPs and we should create a package of new members as quickly as possible to improve competitiveness and we need to be moving on this path as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Raj.
you, Oleg. And having seen no other people seeking the floor, Vincenzo. Thank you, Raj. Well, actually, Nermin should uh, give me the floor, but okay. Just for this time. Okay, I, I will try to be brief and also uh, I'm a good position also to, to sum up a little bit what we uh, hear uh, you know, in the last hour. I think uh, this, there are good news for the, uh, the group led by Peter because at least we assess that basket one uh, is interesting, you know, it's just a, a way to promoting uh, products. Maybe uh, Walter from uh, the, uh, with this, uh, you know, a feedback from the uh, your members, you know, also can help us to understand. We can jointly work to understand how these uh, services can be announced if there is a to also to package them. It may be a, a good idea and uh, why not? So I think we already can say that today we concluded that basket one is something that can be, let's say, open because also was in the request which was uh, was coming from the consultation you know i, I mean talking uh, i'm talking a kit you know language so you know very direct and i say things as they are also i also noted unfortunately that we have some communication problem here uh, because sometimes we we try you know to move from uh, uh, the objective of the discussion. I, I will try to be clear before wh which were, maybe, maybe, for, maybe because also we didn't attract in this session a stakeholder also interested in some sort of services. For instance, uh, and thanks Elizabeth for uh, you know, announcing the financial uh, services which are uh, you know, something very relevant in this discussion and maybe we should have invited also stakeholders interested in those that I'm sure they will give a, a good uh, um, effort you know, to the service themselves, not only for themselves but for the postal operators also because we have not to forget that this opening operation should also make postal operators more competitive. It's just the derivative of the process we uh, have to go. Uh, last consideration, uh, the uh, famous uh, uh, sensitive services uh, and psychode uh, remuneration. First of all, I have to correct you, David. I'm sorry about that. But uh, if you get an MC code and inject anything on the uh, uh, network, anyone has the obligation of the leave. So it's not optional, it's mandatory, Article 1 of the Constitution of UPO. But anyway, we know that regulation can be changed, so that is not a problem. What is the problem, I think, and needs leads with our difficulty in communication, and that was announced by my friend uh, here, that uh, the products of UPO and remuneration is one of those is mail or paid for postal operator. So, easily, we have two options here. Stakeholders becomes postal operator and have the same obligation of the OS, so we don't have to change services. Otherwise, we have to think about of a new system which can be adapted also to new stakeholders. David. Thank you. Oh. Sorry. Okay, so, uh, well, a right of reply. It's more of an informal conversation, but listen, can you do it 30 seconds? Oh, okay, 30 seconds, and then um, I'm going to invite Vincenzo and David to go to the consultative committee uh, uh, reception, and you guys can go at it. I think it'll be a very good for all the members to watch. But David, please, <laughs> floor is yours. Well, if necessary, we can, you know, have a, a legal discussion of this, but and, and I think we have three members of the IB been nodding their heads that, that my interpretation is correct, in fact. There is no obligation for a member state to take an IMPC code. I know for a fact the United States does not recognize any of the 14 IMPC codes that have been granted to non-designated operators, which are still valid codes of the UPU, the United States government has the right and has exercised that right since at least 2004 not to accept those. I just want to make that. That's an important point because 
member countries could, and regulators and designated operators and other stakeholders, based upon what you said, Vicenza, can go back and have the, mis the misunderstanding, for example, that if, and, and I actually very much appreciated what Oleg of Russia just said, he said we need to do, first of all, need to do a technical study to get the parameters. Well, that's what we're talking about with a whiteboard, because a whiteboard exercise is getting groups of technical experts to come together on how a limited time duration, limited member country market test could be done. So we could get this technical study going right away. And again, reporting to S3 on the suggested parameters, and hopefully an S3 actually come out with a, a model for a market test. Um, and just because in that market test, IMPC codes are issued to the non-designated operators who by voluntary agreement of the member countries in the market test and the voluntary agreement of the designated operators in the market test, that they will amongst themselves accept the IMPC codes. That creates no obligation for the rest of the world. The last point I would make and I've addressed this question with a number of our colleagues from various continents, including Africa, including Latin America. And one point I've made, if, if there were a market test that's done, that has no obligation on, for Zimbabwe or Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire or Bolivia, whatever country you name, they have no obligation to participate in the market test. But why would you object as a member country to allowing other countries to voluntarily participate in a limited study? You may benefit from that because two years later or three years later, when they come back with the data and the experience from that market test, that will inform the entire institution and its member countries on what failed, what succeeded, and give them ideas for the way forward. The last point I would make, and I think it's very important, is that we've not had any discussion of the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a UN institution where all member countries, member states of the United Nations. And we have these 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, including related to climate change, I would also add with the pandemic, we've seen the importance of resilient supply chains. And if we are create in this institution, adapting to the 21st century, in which it's about trade and goods via parcels, we create harmonized, integrated, based on the UPU platform where we're not losing volumes going off the platform, but it's then finding ways that designated operators can collaborate with non-designated operators and other sector players to bring back volume back into the network, that's going to help the institution, but it's also going to help with climate change. David, I'm, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to jump okay. in here just because right. we're running enough. short time, but you will be very happy to know that during the POC week, there was actually a discussion with regards to the product suite and looking at environmental sustainability and climate change. And then during the CA week, we also linked during CAC2, we explicitly linked the UN SDGs with each one of the five pillars that the member countries deliberated. So I'm sure that will make you, make you very happy. I did want to, and I apologize to the Deputy Director General. No, 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 Vincenzo, we got it. We got to cut it off, buddy. I'm sorry, I know, I know. You're going to beat me up in the parking lot, I know. I can never make everybody happy. But given that Stuart was seeking the floor, he's been a very intrinsic part of today's proceedings. Um, Deputy Director General, uh, please accept my, uh, my apologies regarding the timing. But Stuart was so kind to give me the floor earlier. I know that uh, he'll elucidate us um, as we bring this to a close. Stuart, please. Uh, thanks, Raj, and uh, congratulations to you and Nermeen for really doing a superb job today on this conversation and really getting a lot of issues out into the open and giving us an opportunity to really have 
a very frank exchange and a very direct exchange about a lot of issues. I did just want to pick up, um, we've discussed some of the issues that were raised in the recent interventions, IMPC codes and Vincenzo's point, there is an obligation to carriage in the UPU. Um, that you do have to deliver. But as uh, David has pointed out, there are exceptions, and I'd point to the ETOs, uh, where we're separately discussing what the UPU's policy on ETOs should be. And we heard the presentation yesterday, I think, that member countries should retain the right to determine how ETOs are, are handled. But I wanted to come back to another point that Vincenzo made about basket one and that being where we can agree um, that we should focus our efforts and, and go to the Congress with that. And I just wanted, from the perspective of the task force, to urge that work continues. And uh, Oleg had a very constructive suggestion uh, about what some of our immediate future meetings could be devoted to, because he does have a point that, as I think about it, our survey asked the question, what benefits will you bring uh, to the network? I don't recall that we had a question about what are the specific risks and what are the downsides that you see. But final point. Um, Basket one, uh, Vincenzo indicated that these are products that are appropriate for opening. And I just want to highlight, yes, the Istanbul Congress decided that they should be opened. So if we go to a Congress six years later and say that we are agreed to pursue opening of products that we decided to open six years ago, that's not a great signal. So uh, I think we've had a great exchange today. We can, we can continue to work on some of the other sensitive issues and uh, in line with the suggestion that Oleg uh, and others have made in the conversation. I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm sure we can continue at the, uh, uh, at the reception and look forward to our Deputy Director General's closing remarks. Thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, if we could go IB, if we can please go to slide 74. We come to the part of the agenda where we receive uh, closing remarks from our Deputy Director General, Mr. Marian Oswald. So, Mr. Oswald, please, uh, if you would take the podium. Uh, First, I would like to thank the panelists uh, for their enable contribution to the meeting today. In addition, I would like to express my gratitude to Nermin, Rush again, Samir, who is online, Stuart, uh, for their great facilitation of such an encouraging and productive discussion. A special thanks also go to the crying trio, uh, Siva, Altamir, and Peter. We had wanted this conference to be a platform for open, constructive, and engaging dialogue, and this is what we have achieved. But we need to move forward, and while we do that, it is important to be aware of the market around us, which is evolving very rapidly, with a lot of things happening outside the UPU. Therefore, working how the best possible relationship between the consultative committee and UPU bodies is going to be critical, which was one of the aims of today's conference. On that point, we got some very interesting insight on how the CC could be better engaged with the other bodies of the Union, speak and to inform one another so that we can all work together for the good of the Union. Meanwhile, some speakers have reminded us of the importance of our critical mission of connecting citizens around the world. UPU products and services are the UPU's tools on how we can deliver on that mission. The ongoing shift of volumes away from UPU to commercial network poses challenges on designated operators. It is no wonder that some of them express concern about opening up. In that connection, interesting remarks were made about what could be a sustainable way forward. For example, sharing the obligation and creating an equal playing field among all players. One critical aspect of the need to be carefully considered here is the universal service obligation, 
The universal service is something that makes the global postal network unique, and this uniqueness distinguishes it from commercial networks. Designated operators fulfill this obligation, and therefore, a level playing field can only exist if due consideration is given to the challenges around the continued provision of a sustainable universal postal service. On the other hand, we heard some great examples of how private sector players are already cooperating with designated operators. Some private players provided DOs with critical transportation solutions during the recent pandemic. Also, I heard the successful partnership in which private sector players are handing over to the DOs their packages for the final delivery against market rates. These two examples illustrate how we meaning the UPU can work on partnerships with the private sector that support the USO while covering the cost of providing that service. These examples are encouraging and, my point, and may point us to areas where we may be able to find possible win-win solution. As some members mentioned, there are also strong differences in postal economic development between designated operators. We must take those considerations into account as we develop our plans for opening up of the UPU's product and services to avoid that any country, citizen, designated operator or wider postal sector players is left behind. Dear colleagues, we are less than one year away from the Extraordinary Congress in 2023. We need to well prepare for the Congress with concrete proposals for member countries to make informed decisions on the institutional framework and access UPU product and services. I applaud to you all for the high-level discussion. That's, in a way, a huge improvement from the past. I also noticed that the usually quiet majority is vocal, and I'm happy because of that. Speaking on behalf of the executive management, we would like to make this organization uh, stronger, better, and sustainable. If we can achieve this with uh, enhanced CC opening up with your consensus, dear members, we will go for it. Also, maybe the most important remark, we are all really on a very different level of market development and market understanding. And we need more discussion like this one. Open discussion, honest discussion, but above all, very respectful. Let me finish with one short liner, one liner. Give us direction, dear members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General. And just before we close, I'm going to give the floor to the CC for an announcement on this evening's celebration. So please, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Raj. Um, it gives me pleasure to invite you all to join the Consultative Committee reception and meet our newest members to celebrate today's achievements. Thank you. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, just before just before you rise from your seats, we're almost done, 60 seconds. I'll give the floor to Nermin to say her thanks, and then I'll close the session. Uh, thank you so much, Raj. Uh, thanks for the panelists. Uh, thank for IP great support. Thank for member countries who and the experts of the Boston Network who joined us, and for the interpreters for their kind support. And wish you a pleasant evening, and looking forward uh, for active participation and contribution to this important work. Thank you, Nermin. Thank you, and have a nice evening. OK. So we're within 30 seconds. What I want to leave you with is one, two, two thoughts. Thank you for your engagement. We had an excellent dialogue. We talked. We had challenges and questions and issues that were raised. But I want to encourage members here that over the next year, as the Dire Deputy Director General said, and, and as the International Bureau said, we have an extraordinary Congress. And if we don't go there with proposals, we're going to go to whichever country wins tomorrow, the right to host the Congress. We're going to go there and we're going to sit and stare at each other. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to have nothing concrete to approve. So I encourage all of you to keep working hard, keep thinking, 
bring your ideas. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we bring this conference to a close. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>